So E3 is over with, the summer now stretches out before us like the intestinal tract of a beached tuberculotic whale, which is the perfect opportunity to slam the door in Summer's face. Fuck you, Summer. All too hot and no games, and don't think I've forgotten about all that David Berkowitz business. I'm going to talk about a game that came out last month, in spring, before everything got fucked up. Strafe, a roguelite. Indie gaming has been beating the roguelite drum like it's a dusty carpet with the face of a cabinet minister these last few years. There doesn't seem to be any genre on God's green earth that someone hasn't thought of enhancing with procedural generation and permadeath. We've got roguelike dungeon crawlers, we've got roguelike space sims, we've got whatever the fuck the Binding of Isaac is. We've got roguelike Castlevania style platformers, roguelike Mega Man style platformers, roguelike straight platformer on the rocks. I hear there's even a roguelike investigative Lovecraftian horror adventure game by some jolly talented indie developer who certainly isn't rubbing himself through his trouser pocket as he types this. No, I don't mean Darkest Dungeon, shut up. Strafe is a roguelike shooter that evokes 90s FPSs like Quake and Unreal and everything else that was low poly and brown like a very disappointing Rubik's Cube. It's a deliberateification of retro style gameplay with a subtext of nudge wink self aware irony, and it's published by Devolver Digital because of course it is. Even if it had tried to get published by someone else, else Devolver Digital would have burst in the window dressed like a highwayman and kidnapped it, because this is very much Devolver Digital's shit. Devolver Digital breakfast every morning on a big bowl of pixels and a tall glass of the piss that it took out of something. There is a plot, in the same way that my cutlery drawer has a grapefruit spoon in it somewhere that I could probably find given an hour and some earth moving equipment. It's something like, you're a space salvager type person and you've been down to some planet space station thing in a distant corner of the universe to find materials, and something's happened to the place and its occupants roughly equivalent to what happened to Sunderland after they started selling diamond white in two litre bottles. But honestly, what the game's about is what all those quake likes were about. Here's you, here's the level exit, and here's 500 grunting primates in Warhammer cosplay who are determined that never the twain shall meet. Fortunately, you have a shoulder mounted murder stiffy with which to blow off all their arms and legs. I don't mind telling you, listener, Strafe has become my new unwindy game. A game that I can just sit down to at the end of a long three hour work day and mindlessly play while I listen to a podcast or maybe some music that young people don't like. Which I hasten to add doesn't necessarily recommend a game. I mean, Euro Truck Simulator has been one of my unwindy games in the past, and it wouldn't be my fucking BAFTA nom. Strafe's just a nice, nostalgic, comfortable place for me. It takes me right back to my youth, playing games like Quake and Duke Nukem 3D and who can masturbate to climax in the school showers without Mr. Trevor's noticing. Straightforward point and shoot action, no fucking stealth, no fucking mini-map, and definitely no fucking pre-animated takedown moves. You see, you never kill only one thing in Strafe. Kill one thing and there's about 17 more things just around the corner who are all triggered by the sound of triggers being pulled, ironically. But if the intention was to evoke the mindless rocket jumping fun of Quake, then that and the whole roguelike element combine like samosas and licorice. In Quake, self-preservation was always fairly low on the list of priorities. It went under killing the enemies, exploring the level, and using rocket explosions to hurl yourself onto the tops of doorways. And that's because in Quake, health packs are lying around like it's Christmas morning at the old folks' home, but in Strafe you can only restore health from the occasional sandwich dispenser that's as generous with its contents as an emetophobe on a desert island, and self-preservation is paramount. I think a more accurate name for Strafe would have been backpedal, because that's what you have to do every single time you alert anything. Most of the enemies are only programmed to make a beeline for you and start thwacking at your undercarriage, and the rest shoot slow-moving bullets, so the smartest thing to do is create distance, wait behind a doorway that can bottleneck them, and pick them off like a disgruntled Walmart greeter. For all the enemies you reduce to clouds of objects that look like they were removed from a sink trap in a kebab shop, it's hard to get a sense of abandon. Especially when you have to be twitchily looking over your shoulder constantly, either for acid spitting traps mounted to walls above the door you just came through, or for one of the inevitable monster closets that randomly open behind your juicy ass. Funnily enough though, the hardest part of the game is probably the first part, when you're on tight corridor safari on board the USS Blind Corner. Get past that and you're probably in for a long run, as from then on the environments get more open and chances are good you picked up nine rocket launchers on the way that you forgot about. Unless of course you used a teleporter, so your handy thing for a roguelike to have is some kind of permanent upgrade to work towards for the benefit of all future playthroughs. Fun as it is to bang your head against a wall, it only gets that little extra spice after the permanent brain damage. In Strafe, you can assemble a teleporter for each level past the first that lets you start on that level rather than the default. So I went out of my way to complete the slightly esoteric steps required and successfully finished the teleporter to level 2, only to try it out next run and swiftly get my balls pulped, because I was trying to beat level 2 enemies with starting equipment. I was plinking away at one of them rock monsters like a lion tamer with a water pistol. So if you are looking for a bell end to the grindstone action power fantasy, along the lines of Doom, or indeed Doom, you might be put off from Strafe, where the starting enemies will mob you like you're a kindergarten teacher with Pokemon cards glued to your ankles. But I'm somewhat into it as a roguelike, there's something very zen about losing everything you've been working towards because of a few careless mistakes and having to start anew from scratch, it's the same reason I set myself on fire every weekend. And what really makes Strafe for me is the little details, the scrappy visual design, the slightly dodgy gameplay choices, the elaborate secrets like the hidden Wolfenstein 3D pastiche, and the bunny hopping level. That's what evokes the freer, more experimental early days of 3D game development in the 90s, more so than any amount of rocket jumping. That's what gives Strafe the edge, the fact that it seems like it was crafted by flawed human beings with a vision in mind, rather than a genetically engineered box car full of human skin with an overfunded marketing department. Imagine my disappointment, listener. Hmm. 
Right, that's enough imagining, here's the real stuff. A new IP developed by some of the guys who worked on Painkiller, that's first person and has guns in and is called something that wouldn't look out of place as the title of a Jason Statham film. Clearly this will be some terribly exciting action murder fantasy with huge guns perched on the end of a stiffy, big enough to impale an entire subway carriage full of eager milfs. Then I actually played it and found that the chest-thumping bellicosity of the title had misled me, and the only chest-thumping that took place was when the game thwacked me reproachfully across the nipples for wanting to kill things with the gun that it gave me for killing things with. Get Even is an odd mishmash of elements, the kind of game that can only be described with a sentence beginning with the words sort of and ending with the word thing, as in sort of stealth action adventure thing, or sort of sci-fi psychological thriller thing, or I sort of pulled my trousers down to show you my thing. The protagonist is named, and you might want to hold a fishing net in front of you or something because when you hear this your eyes might just roll out of your head, Cole Black. He's a grizzled mercenary type bloke who sounds a bit like Sean Bean making out with a fat angry dog. He spectacularly fails to stop a teenage girl getting blown to bits and then wakes up in an abandoned asylum. The world of video games probably has special sorry to hear you woke up in an abandoned asylum greetings cards it happens so bloody often, with the help of a mysterious voice, Cole must use a third-party VR helmet to explore his own buried memories and piece together the events leading up to him not saving a teenage girl from being blown to bits. But nothing is as it seems in the abandoned asylum, as should be expected of any game that introduces total immersion VR as a concept and refers to itself as psychological in any way, so first you don't know if anything's real or simulated memory, and then you don't even know if the simulated memories are reliable, so trying to get your head around what actually happened is like looking for a fun-sized Snickers in a cat litter box. Get Even's gameplay suffers from a lack of discipline, as it indecisively wanders around the buffet table, loading up its plate with spaghetti on one side, apple crumb on the other and pouring popcorn butter all over it. It started off reminding me of Condemned a little bit, as we have to explore the rundown asylum holding up our magic video game smartphone with the functionality of a Star Trek tricorder, taking pictures of evidence, but this turned out to be not much more than a collectibles element for filling out Cole Black's scrapbooking projects. Then we introduce a puzzle element where we use the thermal setting on our magic tricorder phone to follow an electrical wire to the correct fuse box, but I think this only gets used one more time in the whole game, and it's the point as to a fuse box I was about to use anyway, because I was already exploring every inch of the level to document every nondescript stain on the wall that's identical to every other nondescript stain except it makes the evidence detector to go widdly wee. Oh yes, and then a prisoner begs me to release him, and a bit of text comes up to none too subtly inform me that my actions will have consequences. Of course they will. Walking across a room has consequences. The consequence is that I'm on the other side of the fucking room. I know what it really means, that we're strapping in for some of that branching narrative bullshit. So a short ways in, when I randomly press an unlabeled button that lets all the crazy murderers out, I'm informed that I'm a bad person for doing so, and not randomly pressing the other identical unlabeled button that provides free breakfasts to poor school children and brings Scrambles the Wonder Dog back to life. So now I have to worry about my decisions mattering, until about two thirds of the way through through and we switch to a different character and they stop mattering. Christ on a camping weekend, I wish Get Even's game design would put on its own magic VR memory machine, relive its first planning meeting and try to remember what its core element was supposed to be. I feel like there must have been three teams, one working on a stealth shooter, one on an atmospheric horror game and one on an episode of Taggart, and they all had a big after work sex party and accidentally put on each other's trousers. Because the combat element is strangely elaborate, considering that the rest of the game treats it like the vegan at the barbecue, you might reasonably wonder why there's combat at all when we're just exploring VR memories, but don't worry, the game has an explanation ready that it wrote down on a piece of damp toilet tissue, you're subconsciously trying to hide the memories from scrutiny, okay? And conjured up soldiers from other memories, or even books and films, Cole Black apparently reading nothing but Andy McNabb novels, which thinking about it makes a lot of sense. In reality it's just a weak excuse for throwing in token gameplay, but it's doubly strange that the game would rip its trousers squeezing the combat in, and then tell you off for engaging with it. It's actually got one or two interesting new ideas, like the gun for shooting round corners, and a whole lot of very uninteresting old ideas, like being able to sneak up behind dudes and pinch their buttocks to make them swoon with flirtatious shock. But make use of either of them and the game browbeats you you about it as part of the above-mentioned moral choice branching path thing. It's incredibly obnoxious because apparently nothing less than a complete ghost run will satisfy, no kills, no alerts. So when I'm spotted because the minimap lies about the length of the enemy's vision cones and the usual cock-up cascade begins, the voice in my ear droningly threatens me with the bad ending because it apparently reflects poorly on Cold Black's moral character that he can't conceal himself behind a blade of grass. One too many cheat days, I suspect. Yes, the game offers you the chance to redo the memories as much as you want until you do them right, and lays on the are you really 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 sure you want to continue prompts before getting the hammer of judgement out, but putting the effort in for the more positive outcomes would have required me to give a quarter cup of powdered bird shit for the characters, and that wasn't happening. There's a lot of acting going on in Get Even, which is not quite the same thing as acting. Acting is what amateur dramatics productions do when they've been informed there might be a casting agent in the audience. When I had pieced together the plot, I concluded it was about a bunch of unlikable soap opera characters making long strings of stupid decisions, beginning with their haircuts and only going downhill from there. In summary then, Get Even is a bit of a mess, that fails to give its handful of interesting ideas enough room to grow because of the other other 500 things it was trying to do. It was like someone tried to raise baby ducks in a bag of pick and mix. And besides, Cole fucking Black, you raise enough eyebrows naming your character Mr. Black without making their first name another thing that's black. Might as well have called him Edgewood Darkbottom. I have a revelation to make that may blow your little minds apart, listeners. Ready? I quite like Dark Souls. Phew, glad to have gotten that off my chest. It starts to weigh on me if I don't make it clear 60 or 70 times per week. And the indie gaming sector also quite likes Dark Souls because if there's one thing it quite likes above all else, it's retro gaming. And high difficulty is associated with retro 
retro because of the arcade era when gaming was less art than rigged carny game with no prizes, so one of Indie Gaming's ongoing collective projects has been to translate Dark Souls gameplay to 2D, thus bringing Dark Souls and retro even closer, like a couple being hideously crushed into a pulp by a malfunctioning tunnel of love ride. Today I'd like to contrast two Indie 2D platformers that are both taking this challenge from slightly different angles. Hollow Knight, a Metroidvania, and Dead Cells, a roguelike. Dead Cells is still on early access, but Steam's a bit more stringent than it used to be about early access games being mostly done. You can no longer upload a bowl of rice pudding and promise to add the pixels later. So without further ado, let's run them both through the Dark Souls test. 1. Grossness of main character In terms of art style, Hollow Knight and Dead Cells embody the two dominant art styles of indie gaming. Hollow Knight has cutesy hand-drawn art straight from the student portfolio of someone with unrealistic career ambitions, Dead Cells has good old pixel art. But what matters is that an important part of the Dark Souls formula is that the main character has to gross us out a little bit, whether it be because they're dried up undead hollows, as in Dark Souls, or dress like they join their high school heavy metal poetry club, as in Bloodborne. Hollow Knight's main character is a gross little insect, as are all of the enemies, all of the friendly NPCs, and about half the platforms you jump on, but the stark cutesy art style makes it more endearing than gross if in a Nightmare Before Christmas sort of way. Not only is Dead Cells in pixel art, which is slightly gross already because it makes everyone look like they've been fed through a chipping machine and reassembled, but the main character is a lump of snot on a corpse, which is what I call an admirable commitment to the grossness doctrine. Well done, Dead Cells, please don't touch me. 2. Unrelentingly bleak tone Again, Hollow Knight's cartoony, slightly Ori in the Blind Forest-esque style undermines the prerequisite Dark Souls tortured atmosphere similar to that of a very slowly sinking battleship with nothing to eat on board but expired Lunchables. It's just about the only thing that does mind. Like Dark Souls, Hollow Knight is a story not about the protagonist but about the world they're in. A story told largely through suggestion as we pick through the looming ruins and infested tunnels, piecing together the final moments of this doomed once mighty civilization and putting its tortured inhabitants to rest at long last. It's a sort of cockroach scuttling about the ruins with the other bottom feeders vibe. So if anything, making everyone literally an insect is cutting out the metaphor middleman a tad. Dead Cells doesn't give the same impression of telling a story about a place because it's procedurally generated, it'd be a very rambling story with lots of weird tangents that don't go anywhere. As a roguelite, it's very much emphasising gameplay and challenge over story and atmosphere, and you only get the sense of grim bleakness when you die after a particularly long run and realise you'll have to go through those fucking sewers again. 3. Minge creakingly high difficulty Dead Cells, which you'll note sounds a tiny bit like Dark Souls if you get very drunk and say it in an outrageously racist foreign accent, is as we said a roguelite, and that means permadeath. It's not fucking about either, you have to start all over again when you die, right from the septic tank where the snot dribbles out. Meanwhile, Hollow Knight does the traditional thing where you wake up at the last bonfire, I mean bench. Actually, I don't think it's explained why we keep coming back to life, I guess Dead Cells doesn't need to because we're snot and snot can only be truly destroyed by a Kleenex through the heart. Of the two, Dead Cells has the most souls like combat, by which I mean you can dodge roll. Dodge rolls is another thing that sounds a bit like Dark Souls if you put on a ball gag and beat yourself about the head a few times. You can dodge roll, shield, throw bombs and a lot of other things you'll forget about when you panic because you got mobbed by six dudes at once and their vicious attack particle effects. It's also got some shallow RPG elements and a choice of weapons, while Hollow Knight's choice is between using the starting sword or turning off the game and going out for a pasty. The character progression is very Metroidvania, explore new places, find upgrades, so the difficulty curve tends to take sudden dips like a quadriplegic on an escalator, especially after you get the dash, slash enemy, dash away. It works as well for most combat encounters as it does in many real life social situations. It gets hard later on by requiring faster and faster reaction time. Whereas Dead Cells has that Dark Souls quality that even the starting enemies can pulp you into phlegm if you zone out for a moment because you were distracted thinking about, I don't know, water heaters. 4. Exploration Hollow Knight is Metroidvania and Metroidvania is all about filling the map. What's weird is that you can't map an area until you buy a map from the map guy somewhere in the area, but the map's still mostly incomplete and you have to fill in the rest yourself, so essentially what you've bought is a piece of paper. You couldn't have brought one? Drawn a map on the fucking wrap at the breakfast burrito came in? Well I suppose making us explore blindly for a bit keeps us on our exploration toes. Dead Cells, if anything, seems to be trying to discourage meticulous exploration. There are doors to extra bonus areas that lock if you don't get to them fast enough. Fuck you, door! Of course I couldn't get here in under three minutes. I passed by six tunnels on the way here and had to be extra certain that they all contained flashing red clawed death. 5. The Conclusion I suppose asking which game is the most like Dark Souls isn't the same as asking which one's best. In truth, they're both nice little time killers, but on balance, I prefer Hollow Knight as the more complete experience. Dead Cells does a better job at translating Soulsy combat to 2D, but it's like the coin-up arcade machine version. Hollow Knight's got the atmospheric world, the exploration, and perhaps most importantly the sense that we're not pissing in the wind. Dark Souls might be a poor choice of things to give the roguelike permadeath treatment because its monstrous difficulty is a means to an end. We come back and bang our heads on the wall because every chip that breaks off is another step of permanent progress to finally making a big enough hole in the wall that we can get to the candy shop, or perhaps more likely, the next wall. Maybe I've got roguelite fatigue, maybe sometimes when I assemble a Lego building I accept that a little brother might smash it up and make me start again, but maybe there are other times when I want to keep that Lego building so I can tape it together and shove it up my little brother's ass. Once upon a time video games were invented, thus rescuing the human race from not having video games. A short while later someone said, these video games are great and all, but they'd be even better if they were constantly reminding me of my rate of acceleration in standard earth gravity, and thus was born the platform game, a genre that ruled the roost for many years until it was sacrificed on the altar of 3D graphics. Turns out being able 
able to fall off the front as well as the sides of the platform was the one step too far that would make platforming suddenly not fun. Lord knows people tried it anyway, Mario 64 was officially aged about as well as a herring under a floorboard, but during this confused transitionary period a little company called Naughty Dog, responsible up to then for a few nondescript titles like Keith the Thief, said hey let's see if there's a way to make a 3D platformer that doesn't feel like directing a kitten around an air hockey table, and if possible let's see if we can do it while climbing aboard Sony's massive todger and banking their checks for the rest of our fucking lives. And so they developed a 3D platforming system based around moving along a single axis, thus pioneering the concept of 3D, except not really. Great job, Naughty Dog, said Naughty Dog to itself. Now all we need is a plot. Okay, how about something like Sonic the Hedgehog meets... Actually, fuck it, let's just leave it at that. So we end up with Crash Bandicoot, in which a mad scientist with nothing better to do with his time than pick on small furry animals gets decked by one of the furry animals who has acquired advanced offensive capability by putting on some shoes and spinning around a lot. In fairness, Crash Bandicoot takes it a step further than Sonic by putting on trousers as well as shoes, a look known in the cartoon world as the inverse Donald Duck. Crash Bandicoot came out around 20 years ago, a period that the ever-advancing nostalgia wave has recently crashed against with its usual tiresome predictability. So of course the first three Crash Bandicoot PS1 games have been remade in HD for PS4, which presents a wonderful opportunity for old gamers like myself to recreate those wonderful screaming one-sided arguments we used to have about what does and does not constitute a collision. Crash Bandicoot 1 features Crash Bandicoot on a quest to rescue his girlfriend who has slightly disturbingly human sexual characteristics. The girlfriend mysteriously vanishes from all subsequent games for the obvious reason of wanting to avoid turning any more kids into sexual outcasts with deviant art accounts. Crash Bandicoot 2 features main villain Dr. Cortex sitting upon the unsophisticated but surprisingly effective plan of instead of trying to steal the power crystals, simply asking Crash Bandicoot for them. Which works for a while because Crash Bandicoot isn't the sharpest witticism in the book of after-dinner speeches. Finally, Crash Crash Bandicoot 3 pulls the old Masters of the Universe bullshit where the villain is revealed to have been working for another, more evil villain all this time, so now we can get to work on making that villain totally ineffectual and non-threatening as well. The Crash Bandicoot Insane trilogy is the warts and all style of remake, stopping just short of having that special button that switches back to the old style graphics, largely for the benefit of people making comparison videos. It's precisely the same levels and music but with a modern restyling, meaning that Crash Bandicoot is covered in that slightly creepy digital fur effect that makes him look like he was stitched out of bath mats. There have been some changes, you still have to smash every crate to get the gem for each level in an act of flagrant genocide side equivalent to the Blood Diamonds Crisis, but now in Crash Bandicoot 1 you no longer have to do it without dying as well, at least in most levels. This does mean that at the end of each level we have to watch Crash being brutally beaten about the head with every box we've missed until he's prostate and weeping on the floor, which I suppose is motivating but is probably adding sadomasochism to the already exotic cocktail of fetishes you're giving to those deviant art kids. Now I owned Crash Bandicoot 1 on the PS1 and actually 100 percented it back in the day before I had more games vying for my attention than Daniel Radcliffe has weird smelling fans, and as I played the remake and watched myself miss a ledge for the 14th time in a row I became convinced that something fundamental had changed, besides dim division and stiff hands from 20 years of self-abuse, and I'm led to understand that I was right. Mr. Bandicoot's hitbox is slightly more rounded than in the originals, making him slide off ledges easier, so it was only partly the wanking. It's a small change, but it becomes a big one considering how often you called upon to cross gaps the width of a gnat's labia shorter than your maximum jump distance. It's platforming focus after all, and combat consists only of spinning around and nudging things like you're looking for the toilet on a packed subway train. But perhaps the relevant question is not how accurately the insane trilogy recreates the Crash Bandicoots of yore, but how well the Crash Bandicoots of yore hold up in this modern spoiled age of quick saves, auto-aiming, and online wikis providing access to an entire global network of big brothers to get past the hard bit for you. It is easy to forget in our nostalgia madness that the games are pretty murderously difficult even without the edges sanded off the hitboxes. All three games are an adventure in completing the sentence that begins with the words THOSE FUCKING, as in THOSE FUCKING BRIDGE LEVELS, THOSE FUCKING MOTORBIKE RACES OUT OF NOWHERE, OR THOSE FUCKING CHASE LEVELS where you have to run towards the camera so you can only see about two inches of the upcoming road, and hazards require reacting quicker than the amount of time between arriving at your girlfriend's parents' house and them starting to judge you. So to anyone considering the purchase, I counsel caution if you're only remembering the fun parts of the 90s, like the pogs and Saved by the Bell, not the control annoying frustration or the dead princesses, but I think it's too easy to say we're all pampered by modern games that hand out pillows and rim jobs with every pre-order, not in the age of Dark Souls. The fact is, Crash Bandicoot's murderous difficulty is more often related to things other than skill, like the perspective for the levels where you travel into the screen making it difficult to tell how far away the hazards are, and then your spin animation abruptly stops one millimetre from a stationary monkey and you lose a life because I guess the monkey was wearing contact nerf poison after shave, and with the ability to look back from our enlightened 21st century futuristic utopia, what really was the point of that whole push for 3D gameplay in arcade platformers, considering that most arcade platformers these days have gone back to being 2D? You can't even say it was for looks, because early 3D was like rubbing a Lego dog turd in your eyes. Ultimately it made as much sense as grafting two extra legs to your butt cheeks. They have no sensation and you can't run properly anymore, but at least you can wear twice as many crocs. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. My first idea for this episode of the Zero Punctuation Occasional Guide to Gaming's Most Voluminous Trouser Shitting Incidents was that we could all laugh at the Virtual Boy, tee hee hee. But that didn't feel too revelatory, you know. Nintendo's headache inducing Mask of the Red Death didn't do so well. Then I thought perhaps we could all laugh at everything else Nintendo was doing at the time as well, tee hee hee. Because they stepped into more than a few potholes and the potholes were big and black. But then again, Sega was about to fall into some potholes that were bigger and blacker and also full of cum. So I did a bit more reading up and eventually threw up my hands and said, fuck it, let's 
let's all laugh at the entire fifth generation of consoles. Tee hee hee. Funny how the world of gaming was turned completely on its head by the incrementing of a single digit by one, that digit being the 2 at the start of 2D. If only they'd known that one day 90% of the indie games on Steam would be aping the 16-bit era, they could have just gritted their teeth, held on for 20 years, and been perched pretty as the perfect patrician of port pixel art, but no! Everything had to be 32-bit now, sprites out, first generation polygons in. There's no stopping progress, even if progress looks like double-bagged tiger whoopsies being jizzed out of a dead spider. It was a painful transitionary period when the old kings collapsed syphilitically from their thrones and the crowns were up for grabs. What really sums it up is that amid veteran companies that have been doing the console war thing for years, the eventual winner of the generation was the newcomer, Sony, a company best known for a thing for men to use while walking called a Walkman, and their station for playing things on, the PlayStation. Apparently Sony was the one doing all the smart thinking, even if their naming division wasn't. Nintendo went into the fifth generation with everything to lose. The SNES and the Game Boy had created a world in which confused elderly relatives referred to every gaming platform as Nintendos to the undisguised contempt of their children. Perhaps Nintendo had gotten cocky, that might explain why they tried to push a VR console 15 years before commercial VR tech was even remote viable. I could only do red on black sprites and had no head tracking, so it was essentially just the experience of sitting really, really close to a broken TV. But let's not dwell on the virtual boy, that was just an experiment that got rather misguidedly over-promoted, and hey, experimentation is good, that's how we learn. How else would you know that you get sexually aroused from packing peanut butter into a dolphin's blowhole? Partly it was pushed to distract from the Nintendo 64 being delayed half a year, missing the Christmas sales, but that was small potatoes in the long run. The N64 boasted the most powerful graphics take of its time, and first-party titles that still to this day appear in best game ever lists written by nostalgia-blinded twats, who probably still eat children's breakfast cereal. The N64 had the power, the IP, and the good reputation. There was just one tiny little massive cargo container full of bat smegma sitting on the N64 railroad tracks, and it had the word cartridges written along the side. Cartridges did have merits, they load fast and are sturdy enough to still work after you smack your brother with it for asking for their turn, but the same is true of an articulated truck and you wouldn't pick up your dinner date in one. The age of the CD-ROM had come, which may well have been slower to load and stopped working if you used them as improvised weaponry, but in comparison, developing for cartridge was like chiseling the ones and zeros onto stone tablets, and third-party developers were turned off. Ultimately, the third-party developers would be the kingmakers of this generation. Capcom gave their old pals Nintendo the cold shoulder and showed up to the PlayStation's birthday party with Resident Evil. Squaresoft batted away Nintendo's attempt to hold hands so it could go behind the bike sheds with Sony and show them their knickers, aka Final Fantasy VII, but it wasn't just the Nintendo 64 strapped to the railroad tracks. Sega also saw the incoming PlayStation juggernaut, its driver blinded by all the moist third-party developer panties covering the windscreen, and had a little wee-wee squirt which led to them launching the Sega Saturn in the US four months early to selected retailers. But that squirt went right in their face because some of the not-selected retailers got pissy, so to speak and dropped Sega from their lineup. This included Walmart, and so Sega lost the important shithead market. In the end, the Saturn's head start only let the PlayStation piss on the back of its head, but there were many factors leading to the Saturn's failure. Some blame the cancellation of its one and only Sonic game, Sonic Extreme, which would have been the 3D Sonic to counter Mario 64. And yes, I think it's a shame we didn't discover early on that Sonic and 3D meet the way the German invading infantry met the Siberian winter. Perhaps a lot of later unpleasantness could have been avoided, but if you ask me, banking on a console mascot is playing the game by old rules that the fifth generation was in the process of rewriting. Mascots were part of the world left behind the one that would be compressed down into a little comfortable nostalgic ball that Nintendo would wear on its head for the rest of fucking eternity, like a space helmet full of gummy bears. In a pivotal moment of technological upgrade, all the old established ways proved to be nothing but unnecessary baggage that weighed the veterans down as the lithe new hotness ran up and took the gold. So congratulations Sony, you won the fifth generation. Here's your fabulous prize, several million snotty unpleasable fanboys that must now be kept in a state of constant satisfaction. Don't overdo the champagne now! Today, the console conflict is a three-party system. Well, two parties and one bloke chewing gummy bears in a space helmet. And of course, PC gaming, watching it all through high-powered binoculars from the roof of their giant money factory. But in the turmoil of the rise of 32-bit, it was anybody's race. And there was quite a field of the healthy competition we could do with more of nowadays. I didn't even mention the console I had, the Amiga CD32. The console was so good it had to be discontinued and declare bankruptcy after six months to give everyone else a chance. Then there was the 3DO, with its wonderful FMV games that made human flesh look like biscuit dough smeared in water-based lubricant. Or the Atari Jaguar, technically the world's first 64-bit console, in that at least 64 people looked at it and said, well, it's a bit like a console, I guess, but what's with the controller that looks like a Genesis controller got knocked up by a pocket calculator? Hmm. You know, on second thoughts, healthy competition wasn't the right choice of words. Slightly run-down competition, maybe. Or how about competition that could probably get out of bed given a drip, a wheelchair, and the second coming of Jesus? You know, in this age of fear-mongering populist takeover, increasing class divide, and Ed Sheeran cameos on Game of Thrones, a lot of people seem to take comfort in the fact that the mushroom cloud will probably drop soon and burn our eyes out while the radiation agonizingly dissolves us from the inside out. Well, it's a lovely fantasy, millennials, but sadly we're an infuriatingly adaptable bunch, and if Nuclear Firestorm couldn't save us from the Bay City Rollers, it's not going to save you from, discreetly Google's current Billboard Top 40, Imagine Dragons. You're probably just going to have to tough it out, but in the meantime there's no harm in a bit of wholesome escapism with Edmund McMillan's new game, The End Is Nigh. Edmund McMillan is a game designer forged in the old 2000s Newgrounds Flash game era when everyone was learning that lack of censorship plus extremely low barrier for entry equals an awful lot of super violent, poorly drawn cartoon games and animations about poo. McMillan stood out by making such games as Super Meat Boy and The Binding of Isaac, actually quite well designed super violent cartoon games about poo. 
Macmillan's hallmarks besides Pooh include high difficulty, a simplistic but highly animated art style mainly centered around squashy blobs of flesh, an obvious enthusiasm for retro video games, and a grandiose apocalyptic sort of theme. So the end is nigh represents all of his squishy, blood leaking poo monsters coming home to roost, so to speak. It begins with a squashy blob of flesh playing retro video games before realizing he has to travel out into the grandiose apocalyptic world to make things highly difficult for himself. The game is a 2D platformer with much of Super Meat Boy about it, except slower paced and is theoretically an open world as opposed to Meat Boy's level based structure. In practice, though, each room is an individual challenge and there's not much point in coming back to each one once you have the bandage, I mean tumour, so it might as well have been level based for all it mattered. Well, I suppose you might want to come back if you get off on watching water balloons full of gravy explode, but there are plenty of places where you can enjoy that particular spectacle, such as every square inch of the fucking game. Hey, look at me, world, I'm about to say that this high difficulty game is too hard. That's right, now you have a whole brain cell dedicated to me saying that and you'll never get it back. Yeah, genius, it's supposed to be hard, but a slower ramp up would be nice. Difficulty curve, not difficulty wall, not difficulty overhang, slick with eagle jizz. Feels like every time a new element is introduced, it's demonstrated precisely once, and then we're immediately called upon to pixel perfect tootsie jump off it with the exact timing necessary to miss a gargoyle's deadly swinging bell end piercing by one eighth of an inch. And if that's what you want, then I could recommend The End Is Nigh, as well as possibly hiring a therapist to work through your self destructive urges. I like hard games, you know that, but The End Is Nigh is just isn't grabbing me, and I think it's because I don't get a sense that there'll be any reward for putting myself through the trials. I repeatedly pound my testicles with a hammer because I'm trying to save money on a vasectomy, not just for the sake of it. Super Meat Boy had stuff to unlock, a squashy flesh blob princess to save, a dizzying array of secret extras, a lively air of fun, and a varied palette of blood reds and poo browns, and End Is Nigh just feels like Super Meat Boy with none of any of that. Your only reward is more, harder challenges. Fucking hell, at least Sisyphus was getting regular exercise. In brief, I don't think The End Is Nigh has enough going on. I turn on, it goes, hello, everything's gone to shit. I'm shit, you're shit, the world is shit, why don't you come outside and see how shit it is and we'll continue to be whatever you do. And then I turn off the TV news and play The End Is Nigh instead, which gives a very similar vibe, and I don't feel particularly motivated to stick with it. I'm not saying it needs to promise me chocolate buttons and snuggles under a rainbow, just something other than more opportunities to get remorselessly pounded like I'm a turd, it's trying to stomp through a shower drain. Moving on. I thought I'd better play something from the opposite end of the open world spectrum as well this week, if only to stave off the voices, and Steam obligingly belched up the rather ungainly titled Yonder the Cloud Catcher Chronicles, an open world crafty explory hoardy time waste to you, nicey strokey animals game. The vibe I was getting from it was Harvest Moon by way of Zelda Breath of the Wild, build a farm inside a freely explorable sandbox world and help lots of people who are all perfectly alright, except they're missing five moose scrotums for their husband's sausage factory. Also, the art style reminded me of a Playmobil pirate ship I used to have as a kid, especially at the beginning when you're on a pirate ship, although thankfully this one didn't have the spring-loaded cannons with the projectiles that get lost in the carpet for the guinea pig to one day choke to death on. A ship in an intro sequence to a fantasy exploration game is of course equivalent to a helicopter in the intro of an action game, so naturally it's wrecked for no adequate reason, and we're deposited on a beach to start our quest. What was our quest again? Yonder the Cow Tipper Chronicles? Uh, pick up some stuff. Anything else? Uh, talk to those guys. I talked to those guys yonder and they told me to pick up some stuff. Well, there you go then. I think the key phrase that sums up the yonder experience is, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? It is the final destination for every path you can take. You explore the island, find a hidden ore vein in a cave, mine it for copper, then you have some copper. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this? Oh look, a place where I can build a bridge if I bring it 20 sticks, 10 vines and a tube of prit stick. It leads me to an island with a treasure chest containing a vajazzling kit. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this? I think we're supposed to be setting up farms. So we search the land and find the places where farms can be built and build farms on them. What the fuck am I- wait? Now we can find a wild cow, wave a curly whirly under its nose and lead it back to the farm to make it your cow. Okay, what the fuck? Ta-ta-ta-ta-ta! Now find an NPC whose face you particularly don't like and you'd like to go away. Feed them the entire contents of your fridge and they'll go off and run your farm for you. There, you see? Now you've got free milk coming out of the farm whenever you want it. And what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? Look, if you like directions so much, maybe we could get you a fucking kaleidoscope. As far as I can tell, Yonder is a game about becoming the island's random crap baron, on the off chance that some of the random crap will be required for one of the many fetch quests or crafting recipes. The result and you having even more random crap. You can't even sell the random crap because the shops will only exchange it for different random crap. It's like dealing in fucking bitcoins. Honestly though, Yonder's main fault is a failure to commit. Either do the free exploration scavenger hunt or the farming sim because they don't mix well. One is about constantly moving on and the other sitting in one place, behind a cow, elbow deep in colon like the sorter at a punctuation factory. You creative auteur types never think about the damage your genre defying games are going to do. Think of all those innocent shitheads in the 2000s who bought Killer7 because it was tentatively classified as a shooter and ended up tragically suffering independent thoughts and generally becoming better human beings. And now look, what convenient catch-all umbrella label am I supposed to put on Pyre, Supergiant Games? I suppose there's always action-adventure, but that's as informative as a 19th century sex manual. Oh, you want to think outside the box, do you? Well, maybe sometimes I like being in a box, because it's warm in a box and safe and sometimes they contain packets of cheesy what's-its. Anyway, Pyre is a new game from the creators of Bastion and Transistor, which in bold defiance of established pattern is neither isometric nor narrated by a bloke with a voice like melted chocolate dripping off a Darth Vader mask. So here we fucking go, Pyre is best classified as a visual novel, party-based, role-playing, three-on-three -three basketball simulator. Blimey! It's lucky no one buys games from physical shops anymore because this would need a whole new shelf, and the label would be longer than the shelf. Buckle up while I attempt to explain this. In an oppressive fantasy kingdom, literacy is banned, 
perhaps the most sensible response to the popularity of Fifty Shades of Grey books. You, by which I mean the player character, not the greasy unpleasant serial masturbator watching this, are a scholar exiled to the wilderness below the civilised world who hooks up with a group of fellow exiles that need you to read a book they found that tells them about the secret rituals that have the power to free them from exile. For some reason it turns out the rituals all involve going up against a similar group and competing to throw a ball into the other team's hole. If it seems like a rather contrived explanation for the three-on-three -three basketball thing, that's because it bloody well is. Oh yes, and during your Odyssey come basketball tournament you attract several more party members, each representing one of the sentient fantasy races in a case of what we academics call the traditional Bioware bro buffet. Most of the game plays out visual novel style, all the action and dialogue in plain text while characters are represented by beautiful hand-painted cardboard cutouts on sticks, and that didn't bode well for me. I don't like visual novels much, cause call me a ravishingly handsome stick in the mud with a great big cock, but I prefer my games to have some, you know, gameplay in them. But nevertheless I kept playing, reached the first sacred basketball match and then went, never mind, let's go back to the visual novel stuff, less gameplay, less! I wondered what the fucking target audience for this game could be. The overlap between people who like fantasy visual novels and people who like NBA Jam can't be the biggest niche in the world. But I stuck with it, and after playing it all the way to the end I think I'm prepared to say I like Pyre. Obviously I dropped the basketball difficulty to low, because honestly who gives a shit, but I should have remembered that Supergiant games are pretty good at this whole interactive storytelling lark and scratch my scrawny scrotum if I didn't genuinely want to see what happened to these characters. We call it the Bioware Bro Buffet, but between this and Persona 5, Bioware seemed to be the worst at it. Again, I liked the Pyre lads a lot more than I did the Mass Effect Andromeda Burger King Kids Club, in spite of them only being still images that didn't make any effort to emote, or possibly because of. The turning point for me was when we reached the final climactic basketball match on the peak of Mount Globetrotter and the game goes, psych, only one of your party members gets to return from exile, you have to choose which, and everyone else pisses off home to rub gravel in their hair until the next basketball tournament, I mean ritual. The plot then continues with your chosen party member gone, forever, presumably happy, but you don't see or play with them again, and that's what makes the difference. In your mass erects and your flagon ages, you can be sure that all the losers who latch onto you like needy primary school children to the playground monitor are going to be stinking up your castle mooching off your fantasy unemployment benefit forever. And there's always going to be one or two losers who join too late who you never use because you can't be bothered to get them up to speed with everyone else, but with the simple addition of us having to pick a party member to lose every now and again turns that on its head. Suddenly I had to level up Joe Scratchbum and Melissa Nose Pick because the characters I liked had spent the most time with and were the most effective on the playing field were the ones I most wanted to set free, at which point they'll be happy but I'll have to push through the rest of the plot with all the fat wheezy lads that I picked last. Things really melancholy up a notch towards the end when you realise basketball season is coming to a close and you're not going to be able to liberate everyone. I've been deliberately hanging on to a couple of good characters just to keep the matches expedient and that was going to be an awkward conversation in the shower room. Supergiant games are always effectively melancholy through a combination of appealing art and sad music and there was a very real lump in my throat whenever an old hand disappeared forever into a new glorious existence as I tearfully made my way to the nearest pawn shop to flog all their gear for cash. On that note, it turns out there's not a whole lot of depth to 3 on 3 basketball, put ball in hole, that's the design document done in four words, so the token RPG elements feel a bit needless. Your characters level up and gain new buffs and equip items that give them buffs, but the only buffing that really matters on the court is the kind the janitor does to the floor. Yes, this is probably because I turned the difficulty down low, but an extra 25% damage Joe Scratch Bum does to enemies who've just eaten Mexican food or whatever doesn't add much when all you need to do is run circles around the other dudes for a bit, then put ball in hole. I was into the story, but frankly the actual basketball matches started to feel like an unwanted obligation. I very carefully planned the order I wanted to liberate my chap roster, and I didn't want my severely wanting capacity for team sports to mess with it. For you see, losing a match doesn't end the game, one of the NPC players might end up getting liberated instead of yours, and changing the entire course of the story is the kind of pressure I don't need resting on my ability to dribble. Maybe there could be some even easier difficulty setting that replaces all the basketball matches with two buttons marked win and lose, and if you still want there to be drama, maybe the win button could have a spider on it. Still, the fact that the story can keep going regardless of what combinations of characters have been booted skywards is testament to the writing on display, and if the writing is good in a game that's mostly visual novel then wrap it up, Jose, cause I think we're done. Supergiant succeed in doing the organically branching story thing by focusing more on characters and their interplays than the central driving plot. After all, a good story is nothing but the actions of characters, optionally intercut with the odd titty shot. Oh Splatoon 2, please don't think I've been avoiding you. I know I've been knocking off a string of indie games since you came out, and I already regret giving time to that Yonder the Child Toucher Chronicles or whatever it was, but the thing is, I get a terrible sense of foreboding whenever I do a Nintendo game. As I speak, there are fanboys just lying in wait to copy-paste one of the usual statements into this video's comment box, either, well this reflects his obvious bias against Nintendo, or how surprising that he liked it considering his obvious bias against Nintendo. Although to be honest, there was another thing making me particularly leery about Splatoon 2. The first Splatoon was Nintendo's first original thought since Pikmin, arguably. I mean, they basically took one of the standard Mario enemies and made a multiplayer shooter around them with a single player campaign, reminiscent of the things that flake off a 3D Mario game when it combs its hair too vigorously, but even that I knew was using up Nintendo's entire creativity allotment for the next three decades of first party games, and the added excuse of bringing the franchise to a new console made it an all but certain bet that I could review Splatoon 2 by copy pasting my entire Splatoon 1 review and adding a few digs at the Trump administration. And again, I know exactly what you predictable comment section throat mongs are typing in response to this. What did you expect, Yardsy? Torturously bringing out sequels identical to the last game but with absolute best case like two new things is precisely what people want from Nintendo. Use my big Harry Balls as binoculars, if Splatoon 2 had evolved and elevated the franchise to a new peak, if it had been The Empire Strikes 
splat, then no one would be saying to Nintendo, ooh, what a disappointment. I was hoping for the same shit as before, but with a number on the end. You see, sometimes if there's nothing else, a game can be brought down simply by what it is not, and Splatoon 2 is not much worth speaking of if you've got Splatoon 1. You start the game and you're back in the same squid city with the same player avatars distributed about the main square, with speech bubbles coming off showing what that player scribbled into the message window while excrementally bored one day. Interestingly, this time around I saw very few messages to the effect of, ooh, Nintendo are great and I want to kiss them on the knob, which might reflect a bit of a societal mood shift. Or perhaps more likely Nintendo are getting lazier about the message filtering this time. Actually, a lot of the messages I saw were related to furries for some reason. I have a fursona, hooray for furries, I wish it to be known that I'm a very unreliable dog sitter. Was there some kind of call to action in some dark, embarrassing corner of the internet? Does a squid-human hybrid count as a furry, strictly speaking? Or is this just a case of any port in a storm until the new Sonic comes out and they can all whack themselves cross-eyed? Well anyway, I sped through those lads trying not to make eye contact and began my first match, and what do you know, it's the same sodding game! They took that little minigame out that you played to pass the time waiting for the round to start, so I had to get by with thinking about rainbows and touching myself, but otherwise, yeah, you run around in arena, whittling all over the floor, and the winner is the team that whittled on the most of it. Sounds simple, but you'd be surprised how few players seem to be clear on that second part. The game match makes about as well as a Victorian orphan with severe frostbite, so I was going up against dudes all the way up to level 20, but I was still routinely coming up top of the list for most floor piddled on. Something's not right here. I'm notoriously shit at multiplayer, why are you all being shitter? Is it because you have an average age of nine and a half? But no answer came, because you can only talk to each other through a fucking phone app. Which is a risky move on Nintendo's part, because while fiddling with my phone I might decide I'd rather be playing Bejeweled, or that I could get pretty much the same experience as Splatoon voice chat by ringing up the local kindergarten and yelling that Santa isn't real. As before, there's a single player campaign which looked like it was hitting all the same notes. Hub world, collect local equivalent of Mario star at the end of each level, profound sense of a suffocatingly tedious repetition broken up by the odd do thing three times boss fight. I think it was the first boss that killed any interest I had in seeing the campaign through. It was a giant killer baker's oven containing murderous bread with angry eyes. I just don't see what that's got to do with any of the established themes of the game, those being ocean going life forms and a slightly desperate air of 90s coolness. Octopi do not bake bread, nor could one picture Tony Hawk doing it. This Nintendo is why we don't design boss fights right before lunch. So I kicked the single player in the head and focused on the multiplayer modes this time around, and one thing that is new is a co-op mode where you and your team fight swarms of AI-controlled fish monsters in order to collect their eggs, which does rather throw up some questions about the inner workings of this post-human mutant squid society and what specific intentions our employers have for the unborn children of a militant underclass, but who cares, now we can buy new t-shirts to which none of the other players will pay the slightest attention. The fish rampage fetus abduction go round, while not really going anywhere, is a perfectly functional little distraction, but it's not that difficult and your ammo's infinite so I question the need for it to be co-op. All the other players can do is resurrect you, and their main role at all other times is to start the cocking elevator just before I've gotten on the thing. Also, it essentially reduces gameplay to bog standard shoot the enemies while putting the whole whittling all over the floor mechanic in the back seat, which is supposed to be Splatoon's unique core. I think we can all agree, Splatoon, that nobody likes having their back seat whittled over. Finally, one thing I was privileged to witness was a Splatfest, a one-day event that left me very confused indeed. It started with a TV asking me if I preferred ketchup or mayo. So like any red-blooded Englishman, I chose ketchup over that insipid, colourless McChicken sandwich ruiner. I was then invited to battle it out against Team Mayo in standard matches, but after I joined one along with three other Team Ketchup kids, we were kept waiting about five minutes before the enemy team also filled up with Team Ketchup. This happened for every single match, which at first I put down to Team Mayo being as popular as a used tampon in a jacuzzi, but then at the end of the Splatfest, Team Mayo had won the most rounds. Where? I never saw a single Mayo molester. Did I just misunderstand the concept? The winner was whichever team won the most points against itself. I'm not sure if that counts as self-harm or masturbation. You know what, I kind of suspect it was a programming fuck-up, because I noticed one of the dudes in the opposing team on one match went by the name Agent Mayo, and it seemed unlikely that such a person would be ketchup aligned. Unless he was a double Agent Mayo, in which case watch your back, Agent. Team Mayo don't forgive turncoats. You can run, but they'll find you in the end. You'll be walking the streets of Rio one day, thinking you've finally lost them, when you turn around and BAM! ruined chicken sandwich. Many games have attempted to simulate the experience of being insane. It's a tradition going all the way back to when Pac-Man used to ward off hallucinatory ghosts by downing fistfuls of pills, but none of the many video game depictions ring authentic to genuine mental illness. Eternal Darkness equated madness with thinking that you're sitting on your TV remote. Amnesia the Dark Descent just made the screen go a bit wibbly wobbly, and the less said about Crazy Taxi the better, but Ninja Theory are making a very serious effort to tastefully dramatise insanity with Hellblade Hurts the newest sacrifice, a sort of equal parts hack and slash walking simulator about a primitive warrior pulling a Dante's Inferno on Vice mythology. Apparently, Ninja Theory even got in touch with some actual mental health professionals to make the portrayal of psychosis all the more authentic, and hopefully while they had them, also work through the deep-seated issues that made them do what they did to Devil May Cry. Hellblade Hoots at soon as sellotape has also been referred to as an independent AAA game, so already the mental illness thing is coming across pretty well. It's got dissociative identity disorder down fucking pat. Anyway, the game opens with Senwa, who looks like an awkward high school girl drew all over her face with the blue whiteboard marker and tried to wash it off in the septic tank, paddling her way to the entrance of the Viking afterlife in order to rescue her lover, who I think was murdered by Vikings, but it's 
doing the standard walking simulator piece together the backstory through vague arty flashbacks thing, so it's hard to tell. To say nothing of the main character is two consent forms shy of a gangbang and might have imagined all this and is actually carrying around the skull of the local milkman thing. You know, it's just occurred to me that what with this game trying to do a very serious portrayal of real issues that affect real people's lives, taking the piss out of it might make me look like a dick, which is ironic I think because a dick is a thing that piss comes out of. But then I remembered, oh yeah, I've got a mental illness, phew. That means I'm fully within my rights to say that Senua's constant boggling at the camera makes it look like a fainting goat setting off a security light. This very serious game about serious issues takes itself way too fucking seriously. And before you start clipping out that statement to make a hilarious dance mix out of it, obviously I wasn't expecting custard pies and a laugh track. What I mean is Hellblade Hoot Selena Scott's attempt at po facedness is let down by the fact that the main character looks like a blue tinged dork and apparently took acting lessons from the scenery chewer's guide to milking it. It's like she's only got two settings, urgent deer in the headlights frightened whispering and furious defiant screaming with teeth clenched together like two piano keyboards in a sleeping bag. But let's put Senua herself to one side, after all that's what the camera does. Bam! Masterful link. The core gameplay uses a Resident Evil 4 style chase camera as we explore various deserted non-specifically mythic landscapes looking for the fucking gameplay. There is combat, it just takes a while to find it. And incidentally, if anything's going to undermine the very serious message about mental illness more than me comparing the main character to various woodland creatures, it's a bog standard and faintly annoying hack and slash combat element that appears as if by magic every now and again before vanishing just as abruptly, like a sleeping car park security guard intermittently waking up and pretending to work when they think their supervisor's around. So every now and again you'll get locked in a room and gigantic hunky vikings will keep spawning in until Senua works out her issues on their hairy nutsacks, doing the usual light attack, heavy attack, dodge, block, counter, calypso. And it does feel kind of token, like it was thrown in out of a sense that it had to be there for it to be a video game, or to justify characterising Senua as a warrior when I think the premise would have worked perfectly well without that element. What does work pretty well is the whole mechanic where a door won't open until you find a rune in the nearby environment by standing in a specific spot and looking at, say, a tree, a fence post and the post-mortem erection of a staggeringly well-endowed corpse so that they line up into a rune shape. That's a very fitting gameplay mechanic for the theme because that's basically a sign of paranoia, interpreting secret meanings and significance where none may truly exist, like when you hear a dog barking and take it as an instruction to gun down your neighbours, presumably given in a Scooby-Doo voice. Narrative and gameplay work together, so aside from everything else the combat element is tacitly associating mental health issues with kill crazy violence, much the way I did just now. And isn't that kind of reductive? But I haven't even mentioned the other major gimmick of Hellblade huh, sausage sizzles, which it gradually informs you of right after the combat's introduced. If you die too many times throughout the course of the game, it'll delete your progress. Now, from a purely gameplay focused perspective, this is of course the worst idea since Hitler's dad started taking fertility medicine, because it's effectively punishing the player for acquiring a normal learning curve. But from a narrative perspective it makes a lot of sense, because it is the sort of thing that could potentially drive me completely up the wall. And you have to admit, it's a ballsy fucking move, at least on the surface. In practice, don't be too put off by the prospect, because I died in the combat precisely once in the entire course of the game. You can instantly block or dodge anything they throw at you, and even if they knock you down they all stand around swapping workout tips, waiting for you to mash the button that makes you stand up again. I died a bunch of other times and actually came worryingly close to the limit, but that was from a very annoying section where you have to run from light to light, because hanging around in the dark too long makes you die of, um being extra insane somehow. Which is just as irritating a mechanic as it was when Metroid Prime 2 did it. I had no idea mental stability was solar powered. But yeah, the combat's no threat at all. It's actually pretty boring, since every enemy has way too much health and you've just gotta slash them left and right for a while like you're greasing up a fireman's pole. On the whole I feel like Hellblade Hoot <laughs> Salty Sardines is trying a bit too hard. Setting out with this notion of making some terribly worthy game about mental health and then undermining itself with overblown performances and a main character whose backstory is so cartoonishly fucked up that the biggest challenge of the game is finding something to identify with. And then there's the combat that feels like it's fully aware of its completely obligatory nature and has resolved to put in as little effort as possible until it gets fired. By itself, the mental health thing was a nice idea, the Norse mythology thing was a nice idea, the hack and slashy thing was a, well it might have killed an hour or two if I were bored, drunk and paralysed below the waist, and the permadeath thing was certainly a thing. But throwing all of those things in creates a game kind of at odds with itself. So I guess it really does capture mental illness. All it needs is a Lexapro prescription and a tendency to vote third party. Riddle me this, my little colostomy bags. What do you do to follow a series like Saints Row, the anarchic adventure in escalation that in the course of four games organically went from a humdrum crime sandbox to a load of hilarious nonsense about the President of the United States being competent? Well, you'd probably start by picking up all the sweet wrappers and energy drink cans it dropped, but then what? Another sequel? How are we gonna escalate this one? The President has to fight two evil alien space empires? During a skiing holiday? Wearing a silly hat? No. Saints Row escalated to its final gushing purple orgasm and it's time to move on with a new IP. Aww, said Volition. But we can still make it a shooty drivey sandbox, can't we? Of course, Volition. And after all, it's what you know, and there can never be enough sandbox games, apparently. Can we put some characters from Saints Row in it? I don't see why not, Volition. Cameos and callbacks are fun and rewarding for the long term fans, and only mildly annoying for everyone else. Okay, can we use the same logo as the Saints Row games? Volition, you seem to be having trouble grasping this moving on concept. Come up with a new theme. What's another thing you're interested in? Uh, we quite like Saturday morning cartoons. 
Of course you fucking do. And so we have Agents of Mayhem, a cross between Saints Row and G.I. Joe. A Saints Joe, if you will. And possibly the first ever example of a single player hero shooter. The connection to the Saints Row series is a little bit weird. Pierce and Johnny Gat both show up but have completely different backstories, so I'm going to say we're dealing with an alternative universe where the Third Street Saints either never came about or aren't as protective of their branding. The story is, a highly organised high-tech terrorist group, consisting mainly of colourful characters with silly nicknames, tries to take over the world and in response, a heroic high-tech counter-terrorist group is formed also from colourful characters with silly nicknames. All of this is established with little cartoons, in case you hadn't quite grasped the Saturday morning cartoon influence. Meanwhile, the actual gameplay takes place entirely in the ultra-modern city of Seoul, South Korea, which the baddies have targeted for particular punishment. That's a bit insensitive considering the current geopolitical situation, that means I may before this video goes out have to change the above line to the nuclear blasted hellscape of Seoul, South Korea. Anyway, after the usual induction, I'm dropped into the sandbox and Agents of Mayhem unrolls its full city map for my perusal, whereupon I get up and check behind it to make sure it's not folded up or something. Where's the rest of it, Volition? Don't tell me it all got broken off by nukes. No, wait, hang on, I get it. There's more than one city. It's an international terror group, so after we wrapped up the three or four things to do in Seoul, we're going to head to Rio or Milton Keynes. Phew, thank goodness it's not just this one embarrassingly titchy little map that would draw sniggers in the sandbox game locker room. Why are you giving me that hurt look, Agents of Mayhem? Guess this is what we're stuck with, but hey, on the other hand, I've often thought sandboxes can be too big, especially if all they're doing is putting a commute between missions, and it'd be more expedient to keep things tight and jack up the encounter rate per square yard. And this map certainly is tight. It's tighter than a virginal prom queen from a very Christian family with severe cash flow problems. Volition do seem to like getting their money's worth out of their sandboxes. They made the Saints Row 3 map last for three fucking games, like a man wearing his underpants inside out. So don't worry, Seoul is packed with enough car races, foot races, and random battles to make you go, oh, this isn't terribly original. And of course, there are the inevitable outpost takeovers that make all the icons appear on the map, a grand total of about three of the buggers. But sometimes the enemy retake the outposts and you have to re-retake them, which I suppose is functionally the same as a game with seven or eight arse-achingly identical outpost-taking missions, paging Dr. Ubisoft. But I do think it's odd for a game that's otherwise so economical with its content to include the ability to steal cars, considering that A, you can spawn your roided-up agency supercar at any time, and B, every civilian vehicle in the game is a rather humiliatingly slow bubble car that handles like a fucking Roomba. I suspect it's only there because it's the sort of thing one expects in a generic city sandbox, like race missions, an easygoing attitude to vehicular homicide, and lampposts held in place with fucking lollipop sticks. The phrase economical with content was my thoroughly diplomatic way of saying repetitive. Seems like every bloody mission involves going to the same secret underground enemy base as always and shooting everything in it. How the fuck did they build them all? Tell the South Koreans all the rumbling of earth-moving equipment was actually the gentle patter of North Korean missile tests. Everything to do with the city feels like a generic gameplay fest whose primary purpose is to provide a rich vein of grinding in which to build up all your characters, the core element around which all revolves. We acquire XP to level up and improve their stats, we complete missions to unlock new gadgets and legion tech to improve their abilities, we find the hidden crystals to activate their super abilities, although I fully unlocked all of them and still had about 20 crystals left over so I guess the mayhem base isn't going to be wanting for paperweights anytime soon. Essentially it's a game about unlocking all the dudes and finding your favourite combination of dudes to play with, while relegating your other dudes to the Assassin's Creed-esque off-screen missions. Which really don't take long enough, usually around five to ten minutes, about enough time to go down to the sandbox and commit one parking violation before it's time to go back to base, collect the reward and set off the next one. The trouble with levelling up our characters as a core mechanic is the question of why we're doing it. To get better at the gameplay? The gameplay whose purpose is to let us level up characters. Where does that end? Are we supposed to be doing it because we like the characters? Well, there's the fucking rub, isn't it? As I said, Agents of Mayhem is a single player hero shooter, and I think hero shooters are usually multiplayer for a good fucking reason. Multiplayer is an infinite gameplay model in which story is a bonus. Yes, I'm sure the Overwatch wiki would regale me with a story if I ever reach a suicidal level of boredom, but in the game itself, all context is just a splash of colour on a stream of cathartic time-wasting. A single-player campaign, on the other hand, is a journey, in which characters need to show off something more than a gimmick and or extremely broad national stereotype, and dividing that journey between 12 or 13 protagonists doesn't give us room to get attached. Their character arcs consist of two optional missions each, there are ninth tier pro wrestlers with better development. Can we ask much more of a game modelling itself on an artistic medium that existed mainly to sell action figures and lunchboxes? Well, yes! Lunchboxes for a start. So you may have heard there's a new Sonic the Hedgehog game out. You may also have heard certain people say that it's good, slightly inarticulately through mouths muffled by fursuit fabric and cocks. But maybe you're a savvy consumer who recognises this for the usual beginning of the Sonic game post-release cycle. It always starts with the Sonic fans going, It's good! Sonic's good again! Fuck you, Mum! I was right to paint my tits blue and wriggle around on the Chesterfield. But then as the weeks unfold, reality inexorably sinks into the resistant minds of the public like a lead weight on a jelly. Well, I guess it wasn't perfect. Room for some improvement. Quite a lot of improvement, actually. Still better than Sonic 2006. Actually, you know what? Let's just stop talking about it. Holy shit, they announced another Sonic game! Mum, buy more blue paint, this'll be the one! So savvy consumer that you are, you've come to me for the brutal lowdown. Well, first of all, there's definitely something different about Sonic Mania, which might be something to do with Sonic Team's logo being conspicuous by its absence, amid a dense cluster of developer idents I'd mostly never heard of, and thus did my subconscious scream out the words, elevated fan game. Sonic Mania is a deliberately nostalgic sightseeing tour through several old Sonic games, which was also the premise of Sonic Generations, which did it as part of the Sonic franchise's much-needed effort to figure out what the fuck's been going wrong all these years. You may recall that Sonic Generations rather 
ill-advisedly attempted to celebrate the latter-day Sonic games as well, which came across like a toddler beaming with pride at you because they managed to smear a turd all the way across the playroom wall. Sonic Mania isn't making the same mistake and is only concerning itself with Sonic games that can be uncontroversially described as good. Unsurprisingly then, it's entirely 2D and looks like a Sega Genesis game. Still, the commitment on display is admirable. There are bits and pieces from Sonic 1, 2, 3, and Knuckles, Sonic CD. There's even a bit where you have to play a round of Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, which feels rather drastically out of place, but we made a pledge to reference every 16-bit Sonic game, and by Tails the Fox's implied second butthole, we're damn well gonna do it. The plot is a little bit hard to follow, but anything else might have required the characters to have spoken dialogue, so let's not mess with success. It's basically the usual arrangement. Dr. Robotnik steals the magic gems, decides to individually store them in abstract racing challenge levels rather than buy a fucking safe. He could at least store them in challenge levels that don't play to Sonic's strengths, like a bake-off or a cryptic crossword. Still, say what you like about Dr. Robotnik, at least he's a hands-on employer. A lot of managers would delegate the boss fights, but not him. He wouldn't ask those kidnapped and enslaved baby rabbits to show more faith in his contraptions than he's prepared to demonstrate. Anyway, Sonic Mania consists of a handful of original levels packed alongside faithful recreations of old ones visited through some hand-wavy time travel flappery, albeit zhuzhed up with extra features and more elaborate boss fights. But this is where the prickly spider of modernity starts to venture from beneath the comfortable toilet seat of nostalgia, because a fancy elaborate multi-stage boss fight is all very well if the level didn't have a ten minute time limit and we hadn't already spent nine minutes of that getting boinged up the wrong tube over and over again. See, I don't remember the ten minute time limit ever being much of an issue in the original games unless you were in the casino night zone and had a compulsive gambling problem, but in trying to impress us, these extra long levels have suddenly made it a problem. The new boss fights are of a more modern style in that they gleefully piss you about, making you wait for the brief vulnerable moment, when as long as you could reach the buggers, you could bounce on the old boss fights at your leisure and bring them off with eight well-timed thrusts. Besides that, it's an almost totally faithful recreation of a Genesis Sonic game, but that being the case, why was I finding it so annoying? Could it be that a popular retro game from the 90s might actually have been more dodgily designed than we thought, and at the time we were all blinded by lack of alternatives and its obfuscating air of 90s tood? Help me out here. Why exactly was there an arbitrary ten minute time limit on every level in the first place? Was it just because adding an extra digit to the on-screen timer would have been a bridge too far for the Genesis processor? I'd like to digress, if I may, and examine the old Sonics from which Sonic Mania takes inspiration along with several hundred art assets. The very first Sonic game, Sonic the Hedgehog, back when he still went by his full name and before the title of every single game was the word Sonic followed by whatever was on Sega's Word of the Day calendar, things were a little bit wobbly straight off because we hadn't quite come to terms with the whole gotta go fast remit. It was still a little too mired in the general standards of what a platformer was, a little too much accurate jumping in cramped hazardous tunnels where the only people who gotta go fast were the profoundly bored with life. That underwater ruin level in particular was like having to push a tomato through a tennis racket. Sonic 2 and 3 and and Knuckles brought the going fast and the obligation thereof to the forefront. You were traversing huge sections of maps so fast you couldn't tell where the fuck you were going and you were afraid to press anything in case you accidentally jumped up the dilated exhaust pipe of a giant robotic arse. And what lets these games down and by extension Sonic Mania is that the levels are very annoying to explore. Easy to get to the end of, sure, just hold right and press jump every time you stop going right. But if you want to explore, and spoiler alert you do, because that's how you get the Chaos Emeralds and avoid the post credit screen with Dr. Robotnik provocatively waving his bollocks at you, then you have no way of knowing if a given path will take you to some lovely secrets or will lock you into a gun barrel that fires you halfway across the map through nine loop-de-loops and the intestinal tract of a whale before slamming a point of no return door shut behind you with a great big middle finger painted on it. This is one thing the first game got right. Get 50 rings by the end of the level, bam, secret stage. Having to find the secret stage is like finding a speck of lint in a candy floss machine. Alright, well, before all you fanboys start impotently tugging at my jumper while making noises like the last squealy fart of a dying manatee, yes, the Sonic games are rightly well regarded for their characteristic style, the whole drop the rings thing is actually pretty ingenious design, and hauntingly familiar to those kids who used to get their lunch trays knocked out of their hands by school bullies, but that style was definitely papering over some cracks. I wish they picked a jump sound effect that didn't grate as much after a while, like the sound of a set of bagpipes being dragged across a chalkboard. Nintendo, what the steaming cross-eyed fuck is this? I'm still trying to get my head around it. A crossover between Mario and Raving Rabbids using turn-based XCOM-style combat? What is this, a fucking mad lib? Or did someone lose a bet? If only you'd won the beer pong tournament at the last game dev party, Sony would have had to develop a city management sim starring Crash Bandicoot and Pyramid Head. Look, I'm not ragging on you for doing something unexpected, I applaud that. If you only ever gave people what they asked for, every game would be an identical fucking multiplayer hero shooter with a range of unlockable nipple tassels. But when you set out to partner up with Ubisoft, was Raving Rabbids honestly the best option to cross over with Mario? I mean, the Assassin's Creed series is also frequently based around jumping on people and already has a bunch of comedy Italians in it. Tell me you couldn't picture it, Mario in a little assassin robe, jamming a wrist spike into an unsuspecting Koopa Trooper to make coins fly out. My point is, when was the last time Raving Rabbids was raving relevant? They haven't had a non-iOS game in years since those minion things ripped off their entire shtick, but it was never much of a shtick to begin with, was it? They look funny and run around hurting themselves while making high-pitched mouth noises, in a startlingly insensitive depiction of the mentally subnormal that wasn't particularly funny when the first medieval court jester 
Gunther did it. But three-year-olds and the inbred kings of 11th century Europe dutifully laugh and clap their hands and so such things persist. My point is, rabbits are complete non-characters, but here they are sharing equal billing with motherfucking Mario. That's like a political marriage between the Prince of Denmark and the daughter of an up-and-coming sausage manufacturer. And then I guess you hold the wedding in the fucking sea of tranquility because neither Mario or rabbits have ever been associated with strategic gun battling. And more to the point, three-year-olds and inbred monarchs probably wouldn't have the patience for it. Well, let's not spend five minutes boggling at the premise alone. The execution has lumbered up and rested its deformed skull on my workstation, and now it's up to me to tell it if it's ever going to be a real boy. The intro spends just a bit too much time establishing the incredibly contrived series of events leading up to the crossover, so I'm assuming Ubisoft had the larger hand in that side of things. If it had been left to Nintendo, it would have been Mario and Rabbids meet in a field, Bowser kidnaps Princess Peach, and here's some horrible motion controls we're not going to let you turn off. Basically, someone invents a device that combines two things into one thing, Rabbids randomly show up and nick it, and the lab is for some reason full of Mario action figures, and for this reason they all get teleported to the Mushroom Kingdom, where Mario and Princess Peach are going through the tense motions of yet another day of meaningless royal ceremony and passionless pity sex. Mario and chums must then restore order by murdering all the unwanted foreign immigrants with the aid of some rabbits who have dressed up like Mushroom Kingdom residents to show their willingness to collaborate with the Peach administration's genocidal atrocities. And everyone gets a gun somehow. I warned you it was contrived. You may notice that at no point did I mention Princess Peach getting kidnapped, because this is one of those rare occasions when she gets to be a party member with some appropriately twee skill, like group healing or umbrella floating, or in this case wielding a giant explosive close-range death cannon. Somebody asked me during the week if the rabbits actually add anything, or if it might as well have just been a Mario game. Well, they do if you are one of those people who find it eternally amusing when someone's eyes are far apart and they go boah a lot, and you're no longer allowed in the Down Syndrome Center. But the same question seems to have haunted the developers. There are eight playable squad members, Mario, Luigi, Peach, Yoshi, and rabbit equivalents of each, and only three to a squad, so what if the player only uses Mario, Luigi, and Peach the whole game? It wouldn't be Mario and rabbits at all. Then, it'd just be Mario murdering rabbits, and we've been skating on thin ice with the racism thing ever since we gave Mario an outrageous comedy Italian accent. So the game flat out forces you to put at least one rabbit character in your party. No explanation is offered, the game just greys out all the home team Mushroom Kingdom lads if you've already got two. So if you want to team Luigi's long range focus with Peach's short range superiority, then you can eat feces fettuccine, my friend. This might be the first example of a gameplay mechanic introduced solely for the sake of the contractual obligations of its characters. But let's take that initial question a step further, matey. Does it being a Mario game actually add anything? That business with giving Princess Peach a giant shotgun implies that it is basically just an XCOM combat engine with Mario art assets stretched over it, like a lunchbox or children's bedspread, for Mario is now merely a brand, a Windows desktop theme, and if adding Bayonetta to Smash Brothers didn't already tip you off to this, today's Nintendo demands integrity and consistency only of its quarterly income. But none of that should get in the way of your enjoyment of the gameplay, which should appeal to anyone who ever watched their last surviving XCOM squad member hold a shotgun six inches from the face of an alien berserker the size of the cliffs of Dover and somehow miss. Here it's nicely straightforward, if they're in range and out of cover and you haven't mistaken your gun for a giant uncomfortable suppository, then you're guaranteed to hit. And the warp pipes and jumping abilities give a full range of ways to get into position, you're not stuck creeping your squad forward bit by bit, slamming on Overwatch like it's the snooze button. But as much as I appreciate the simplifications, I'm on the record as enjoying XCOM combat and by the end of this sentence we'll be on the record as not enjoying this very much. The difficulty gets annoying after a while, possibly because we unlock new better weapon upgrades with each victory but I couldn't always afford them, so there's a subtle obligation to grind, as well as some very unsubtle ones, like when your path is blocked by a huge sexually aggressive panda and the game goes whoops you'd better replay this level after you unlock the Chinese zookeeper's wanking gloves. But also in XCOM there's a constant sense of discovery, from both revealing the current map and our ongoing understanding of the alien threat, whereas I feel like we go into Mario games with everything pre-discovered. I'm going to assume Bowser will be involved, and in the end Princess Peach will refuse to put out. I'd also like to note that XCOM made me actually give a shit. Evil aliens trying to kill us all when we'd rather not be killed, thank you very much. Here it's just, there's rabbits, and they're generally bringing down the whole tone of the place. Again, it's designed by contractual obligation. I'd like to ask for slightly more motivation than propping up Nintendo and Ubisoft's failing marriage. I had a terrible sense of foreboding from the prospect of Destiny 2. Maybe it was the way I looked it up on Wikipedia and every bloody paragraph started with the words just like in Destiny 1. I felt like I had enough to go on right there. Oh boy, another installment of the game so emblematic of everything that's wrong with AAA games these days that if you stuck pins in it then all of AAA gaming would get twinges in its back. Another fucking Skinner box drenched in grandiose scenery to distract from the fact that it's got no fucking gameplay ideas beyond go to place and shoot the lads over and over again, and no real story beyond here are some lads who deserve to be shot after you have gone to the place. Don't forget to pre-order for your bonus golden cat suit and matching staple remover, although we're gonna reward you with new bits of armour every time you successfully shoot a certain amount of lads, the way one rewards a budger a with yummy millet seed every time it climbs the little ladder and rings the little bell, so your physical appearance is gonna be in a state of constant flux like one of those suits from a scanner darkly, but even if it wasn't, every character is over-designed to the point of meaninglessness, so you can't make any kind of mental attachment, which will hopefully pay off in a couple of years when we want you to stop playing this particular Skinner Box and buy Skinner Box 3, The Return of Jafar. But let's not preemptively write off Destiny 2, like a prom date who picks us up on a riding lawnmower. Besides, it's either this or Knack 2, or asphyxiating myself to death in my car, and since the neighbour borrowed the hose pipe, I'm stuck with this. Destiny 2 returns us to the wonderful future Earth, where humanity is watched over by a giant cue ball with a vague understanding that it's benevolent, and that no giant snooker player is going to show up and pot the entire planet down a black hole. I played the original 
Destiny and yet couldn't tell you now what the fuck happened in it, but none of it seems to matter at Inker's cusp because a generic evil alien race invades the Earth and puts a great big muzzle on the cue ball, taking away the superpowers of Earth's guardians because they couldn't remember the safe word in time. The main villain is the sort of ridiculously operatic figure one should expect from a Bungie game and looks a bit like a muton from XCOM got elected Pope. Fortunately, one hope remains in the form of a lone guardian who never speaks and has no name and if you're me looks a bit like David Warner wearing bright pink lipstick and green eyeshadow because why would the character creator even have that if it didn't expect you to use it? The protagonist, or as I like to call them Widow Twanky, crawls out of the ruins of the Earth and manages to get their powers back by as far as I understood the process asking nicely. Your job then is to get the old band back together, meaning three guys we saw for two minutes in the intro sequence that are apparently important. They haven't got their superpowers back, but I guess we need them to tell us what to do next. Actually, maybe these guys were in Destiny 1, but just to reiterate, I played the Destiny 1 and I haven't a fucking clue. It's classic Bungie characterization, some very determined self-righteous people who do the right thing and have no sense of humour, and some who are designated funny characters, meaning they are also determined self-righteous and do the right thing, but they also over-clarify their statements a lot and determine aloud whenever a situation has become not good. These characters' personalities are entirely defined by things they say, not things they do, because they don't do anything. They wait for you to show up and tell you to do things, and those things are invariably go to place and shoot the lads. So as the only guardian who thought to ask nicely, we are the only one who can save the handful of hub maps from all around the solar system, just us and the other 10 million players running around. But that's probably one of those things we're supposed to suspend our disbelief about. Still, Density 2 at least started off a bit less like a dreary mire of knee-deep cold sausage meat than Density 1. There's a nice straightforward alien invasion, and for a while the plot moves along at quite a clip. You start off on smashed up earth picking bits of alien shoe leather out of your bruised bottom, then a few time jumps later you're getting your powers back, then you piss off to an ocean planet, and you've barely unfurled your beach umbrella before the plot mission's done and it's time to piss off to the next planet. So Destiny 2 has quite a long piss about deferment index, or PDI, which is the term for the amount of time a free-to-play or Skinner box game gives you to get settled in before it starts pissing you about. It only started when out of nowhere the next plot mission required me to grind up two more levels, which wasn't much. I only had to do a couple of side quests, or rather adventures as they are called here, which I suppose is one way to make them sound interesting. Ho, oh, traveller, are you a stalwart enough hero to adventure to a place and shoot the lads? But then after the next plot mission I needed to gain another four levels to proceed, and yeah, I guess I see what we're doing here now, Destiny 2. Still, at least the scenery is nice. In fact, that brings me to a strange epiphany that struck me while I was playing the game that I'd like to share with you now. It was while I was following a series of objective markers in order to get to a place wherein might be found some lads to shoot, I paused about halfway down a corridor to take a break from the sheer roller coaster of excitement the mission was turning into, and found myself staring at the wall texture. We were in one of the several hundred ancient alien temples covered in somehow still functioning LEDs that Bungie have made across their career, and the decor had gone for an intricate pattern of narrow lines and right angles, but then I looked closer and saw there were multiple layers of lines, some in sharper relief than others. I got curious and looked around the entire surrounding area for where the pattern repeated, and I couldn't find it. Every part of the wall seemed to be a unique combination of lines and little glowy lights. Who were you, mysterious wall texture designer person, with whom I feel a strange kinship as I gaze upon your work? What ambition spurred you through the years of practice and higher education that brought you to this place? When you dreamed of your artwork being hung up on walls to be viewed by millions, is this precisely what you had in mind? I pictured them heading back to their cubicle to touch up another series of functionally identical but slightly varied wall textures, and passing a meeting room where they overhear some designers discussing how best to word the latest iteration of going to a place and shooting some lads, whereupon they heave a weary sigh and add another few names to the workplace massacre checklist they know damn well they no longer have the balls to execute. Are you sure there isn't something else about Destiny 2 you'd like to talk about, Yards? Like, say, the PvP, or the level design, or the fact that the three different categories of weapons are now called something different to what they were called last time? No! I want to talk about how I stared at a wall for five minutes and it was somehow the most interesting part of the game. I'm starting a new wave of game criticism right here. It's called Up Yours Publishers. You've got to admire the dedication of these AAA publisher types. New games like Doom and Prey and Breath of the Wild that employ a retro gameplay philosophy have turned all the heads lately. Re-releases of classic consoles sell out in roughly the time it takes to say the words blatant artificial scarcity. The Steam lists are choked with retro style indie games like a first time porn starlet to whom no one explained what DVDA stands for. And in response to all this, the AAA publishers say, so what we're hearing is that we should make more bloody identikit Skinner box games. As I say, you've got to admire the dedication and shun every other square inch of their repugnant amorphous slug-like forms. The exception as always is Nintendo, who do not need to be told that nostalgia pays off because they already carve that into the forehead of every fucking employee. It's part of the induction day schedule now, right after biscuits and pointing out the toilets. Seems they accidentally put their name on something halfway original this month and the balance needed to be redressed, so they spun the wheel of Nintendo policy and it landed on Remake Old Game, which shouldn't come as a surprise as that option covers half the bloody wheel, with the other half split between Make Low Effort Unwanted Spin-Off and Announce Another Fucking New Console. So we have Metroid Samus Returns on 3DS, which is a remake of the Game Boy title Metroid 2 Return of Samus. The microscopic change of subtitle might seem a bit needlessly fussy, but while expressing the same sentiment, the subtitle carries a vastly different connotation than it did in 1991. Back then, Samus was returning in triumph. Metroid 1 had been her glittering debut, and the gaming public were collectively holding out their dinner plate with a hearty more please. Today, on the other hand, Samus is returning in the sense that she's being let out of the doghouse that Nintendo has been making her live in for the last few years. They let her out in Metroid Other M to run around crying in her underpants while narrating like she was reading aloud a very boring 1950s textbook on gender 
gender politics. And then in Federation Force, her role was roughly equivalent to that of the sexy lady the fighter pilots paint on the side of their nose cone. Nothing to do now but go back to formula. Samus explores an alien planet, shoots Metroids, walks oddly sexily for someone wearing a Sinclair C5. Story and dialogue has been rather mercilessly kicked down the priority staircase, so my fellow other M veterans can feel relieved that Samus keeps her mouth shut and doesn't spend the whole game going on about babies like a 35 year old spinster after three months of dating. We're literally just handed a list of Metroids to kill and sent on our merry way. Through a traditional Metroid adventure in 2D platforming exploration, shooting at walls to find secrets, and shooting at angry wildlife to find a pathetic sense of limited power and superiority. Now I've never played Metroid 2 for the GameCube, so I can't tell you how accurate a remake this is, but if that factor is important enough to be a deal breaker for you, then please suck on an exhaust pipe and remove your lazy nostalgia centric pollution from the cultural gene pool. I am prepared to bet that the original didn't have a parry button that effectively turns every single monster into a quick time event, but honestly I kind of like this feature because it means I don't have to keep holding down the free aim button. A posture that with the 3DS's sharp corners is still as unpleasant for my large dainty fingers as a fistful of angry plague rat. Besides that, Samus Returns demonstrate a strong commitment to replicating those nostalgic feelings of frustrating gameplay and dodgy controls. At least that's the only explanation I can think of for some of this interface design, considering how many wonderful buttons the modern handheld has, and how many wonderful alternatives there could have been to the control layout we've got. Press right on the d-pad to select rapid fire, press A to activate it, and then finally press X to actually shoot the bloody thing. Then you have to press A to deactivate it unless you switch to a different special power, in which case you'll have to press right again first. And bear in mind you'll have to do all of this in the 12 nanoseconds you have before the charging monster that for god knows what reason can only be harmed by rapid fire smashes right into the big stupid Lego spaceship cockpit that is your face. Also don't forget the grapple beam is now a setting of your main cannon, so you can't grapple and shoot at the same time and need to make sure you haven't absentmindedly left it on grapple lest you plough into the next room of baddies and end up ineffectually trying to lasso their turgid alien genitals. And since I brought it up, I didn't know that rapid fire also has the ability to break the weird grey spunk bubble things that block narrow passages. I did three circuits of the fucking level looking for the clumsy fellatio power up before I figured this out. I know we're going for that minimal dialogue retro feel but a speck more dialogue to clarify this wouldn't have hurt. Hell I'd have been happy with a fucking rebus. Well I think that sums up all my major nitpicks. I should clarify that altogether they probably won't be enough to turn off those of you looking for an authentic Metroid experience to while away the hours. Although if you are more familiar with Metroid as the thing that coined the first half of the Metroidvania genre, you may be a little disappointed by the way this game's laid out as a linear sequence of progressively harder areas, when Metroidvania should ideally involve having to go through old areas to reach new ones, so that going back through level 1 and finding the optional upgrades that you can't get without the plasma trouser press from level 4 can be done organically without having to temporarily slam the brakes on making progress. Again though it shouldn't be a deal breaker. I think the worst thing I can say about Metroid Samus Returns is that now I've played it I will almost certainly never play or think about it again. Not that it was bad, it just went into my brain space, my brain space said yep that's a Metroid game alright, and then kicked it straight out the exhaust pipe. I've had a similar revelation of late concerning Zelda Breath of the Wild. I remember being into it, I remember liking being into it, for there is such a thing as not liking being into something, heroin springs to mind, but I don't think I've spared it a single thought ever since I beat it. See this retro style, heavier on the open ended gameplay lighter on the linear story is all very well, but there was no need to throw the baby out with the malfunctioning automatic circumcision device, and while gameplay keeps us occupied on the moment to moment level, story is the part of the game you actually remember and stays with you. I suppose it's a question of what you'd rather have been in high school, the kid no one noticed or the kid who tried to castrate themselves with a belt sander. Do you mind not getting invited to parties or can you accept that every time you show up someone's going to hum the opening riff to enter Sandman? You remember Knack One, it was a launch title for the newborn PS4, for it is just as true in the games industry that newborns come into the world covered in blood and shit and scraps of tortured uterus. At the time I summed up my opinion with the phrase Knack is cack, but honestly it was what you'd expect of a launch title. The launch title's job is basically to use the graphics hardware to erect a big glittering neon sign saying your game here. Just something that looks halfway decent and has some basically functional gameplay that isn't going to blow any minds, something that will look glittery for the dumb dumb masses who have grown bored of staring at their jangling keys, but also doesn't scare them off and provide a nice low bar for developers to top as they get to grips with the hardware. It's like how you want the opening act to be someone competent enough to warm up the crowd, but not so good that they overshadow the main event. With that in mind, bringing out a sequel to a launch title four years down the line that isn't much different to the first is like bringing the opening act on again to play the fucking encore while the main band hide backstage, crying and gorging on wagon wheels. Yes, Knack was cack, but Knack 2 is cack poo. The premise of the franchise, but we now must call it a franchise however much the word sticks in my throat like a bitter toilet brush, is that you play a sentient creature made of the kind of small geometric wooden puzzles commonly bought as stocking fillers who can grow indefinitely by adding more puzzles to his mass. Knack, for tis his name, is also an unstoppable fighter and problem solver with a very good speaking voice whose existence is shrouded in the mystery, and yet despite being the player character he doesn't seem to be the protagonist of the story. That honour goes to a drippy little teenage twat who hangs around with Knack to form a highly effective world saving partnership. Knack provides the muscle, the intellect, the lucrative royalties from his side gig recording audiobooks, and the kid provides, uh, a nice flat head for Knack to rest his beer on. And yet the game persistently focuses the story on the little bastard and his problems as he whines about no one taking him seriously. Maybe that's something to do with the way he sits on his ass the whole time, letting his bucket of Rubik's cubes do the work. Essentially Knack, and by extension us as the player character, are treated like the family dog, who's let off the leash at the start of each level to run ahead scaring off goblins and German holidaymakers so that the human characters can hang back and scoff all the poor 
pork pies. And I can't remember the last time I was so utterly sewing needle under the fingernail to keep me awake bored while playing a game. The Division, maybe, but at least The Division gave me a gun so I could compose satirical haiku on the walls in bullet holes. Knack 2, much like Knack 1, takes place in a very, very long, very winding corridor with only one route forward. Occasionally there's a cutscene where Knack stands around like a spare banana at a dildo factory, while the human characters establish the reason why we're going down the next section of linear corridor. Sometimes Knack will fight some guys, sometimes there's a block-pushing puzzle. It's basically like being a supermarket trolley attendant in revolutionary France. But the niceties of the gameplay hardly matter since Knack's non-presence as a character in the plot creates this profound gameplay and story disconnect. That means I gave so little shit about what happened that were I to review Knack 2, I'd probably very abruptly give up halfway and start talking about a completely different game. Steam World Dig 2 is the slightly awkwardly titled sequel to Steam World Dig, a game about digging in a world, also Steam. It's 2D, it's a platformer, and it's a Metroidvania, and already I can sense your eyes start to roll faster and faster until you could hook them up to turbines and generate cheap energy for struggling nations. Fucking every 2D platform is a Metroidvania these days. No reason not to be when systems don't need to load up levels one at a time anymore like a dexterous waiter in a narrow corridor, but stick around, this one may have a hook going for it. We play a robot who comes to a town of robots in the desert to find the protagonist of the previous game who disappeared down a hole and then presumably filled it back in behind him and replanted all the fossilised enemies, so our job now is to dig down until we find him, selling whatever ore we find to buy upgrades on the way. See, how you make your Metroidvania stand out these days is to add a unique spin on the usual templates. Properly unique, mind, not just renaming the inevitable double jump to the Voluvian self-ejaculation technique or something else that doesn't sound like a Vulcan wanking manual. SteamWorld Dig adds tunnelling gameplay reminiscent of Dig Dug or Boulder Dash, so instead of a determined sequence of platform challenges, there's just a big fuck-off mass of dirt between you and the next place you need to be, in a sort of stark metaphor for the immigration process. So you have to dig your own way through, in a way that lets you grab all the ore without crushing yourself or accidentally creating a six-story death drop. I like it. It's sort of like Spelunky but without the roguelike aspect, which is another thing that's gotten a wee bit overexposed in indie platformer circles. Yes, some wonderful things can be done with procedural generation these days, but let's not forget that you can't beat a properly crafted experience. A carefully rehearsed and well-timed comedy routine will always beat someone reading aloud a list of their favourite swear words, unless you're on BBC Three. SteamWorld Dig 1 reminded me of one of those Flash games where you're trying to launch a guinea pig into space or whatever, and each failed attempt earns you a little bit more money to add another carrot-shaped rocket booster to his little furry bum. SteamWorld Dig 2 has a much stronger plot with better characters. The protagonist has a tag-along they can have conversations with, it's not just us alone in the dark knocking holes in rocks, sheer loneliness causing us to slowly come around to the idea of sticking our knob in one. Also the world unfolds more engagingly with better player training, movement generally handles more smoothly and the chipping at walls is slightly less tedious, so on the whole Dig 2 feels more like a refinement of Dig 1 than a sequel, which does mean the constant calling back to the plot of Dig 1 feels a bit misguided. No need to shackle yourself to continuity, pretend it's the first time every time, if it's good enough for The Legend of Zelda it's good enough for you. Also I can think of a couple of other refinements that could have been made. The lantern that keeps running out of oil feels unnecessary, I mean our health gets restored on the surface, and our bag can carry about as much as a hand basket at Safeway, so we've already got two systems making us go back to the surface at regular intervals, a third one that's a literal timer feels a bit gratuitous. Could have done with more boss fights too, actually it's generally kind of short, but just think of it as a nice inoffensive between meals snack. Summer's nearly over and the big releases will soon kick in, but for now let's sit down, put our feet up and stick a great big handful of dirt in our mouth. Viewers, do you think there's something wrong with me? Rhetorical question, hands down please. I ask because my favourite kind of gameplay is ball busting difficulty, and all my favourite story based games seem to be miserable and depressing. In fact, what might as well be my favourite game ever is both ball busting and miserable. Not that having your testicles mangled should ever give one cause for optimism, but you get my point. And then there was that time I shat all over Ori in the Blind Forest for pulling a happy ending out of its ass and giving me misery blue balls. But balls aside, I checked over my childhood for some kind of trauma that might explain this, and I couldn't find one in any of the memories I hadn't suppressed, so am I just a fundamentally negative person? Is that why I've spent the last ten years swearing and talking about my balls for a living? Well, who can say, but things might be changing because I actually quite like Cuphead, and it's not miserable at all. It's a bright, cartoony, upbeat romp. It is, however, so ball-bustingly hard that you'll be jizzing ball shrapnel for weeks. And having said that it's cartoony and upbeat, its premise admittedly is that you're crippled with gambling debts and now have to collect from fellow debtors or be murdered by Satan. See, the rub is that Cuphead is retro style, but not in the usual sense, i.e. pixels the size of Plymouth. It's deliberately fashioning itself after retro animation in the style of Max Fleischer or very early Disney, and pulls that off with quite remarkable success. The film grain, the scratchy audio, the big brass band soundtrack, the fluid exaggerated animation where characters all move like warmed up gummy worms caught in the spokes of a bike. It all feels so bloody authentic. And most importantly, what a lot of people forget about early cartoons, here we very unsubtly waggle our eyebrows at Epic Mickey's forgotten gravesite, is that they could be really fucking dark. See back then it wasn't generally understood that kids needed to have their delicate sensibilities protected, as odds were pretty good they were all going to die in a European trench war before they turned 18 anyway. So thematically cartoons were lighter on wholesome lessons about friendship and heavier on skeletons and racism. So there's something overtly sinister about Cuphead which might be from subtly 
wrong things, like the drinking straw in our character's head. I mean, the teacup head thing I buy, but who the fuck drinks from a teacup with a straw? That's just pushing it. But I think it's the overall scratchy look and feel that makes me think the little girl from the ring could push out of the screen at any moment and start making comical trombone noises. This surreal, almost elegiac atmosphere pairs remarkably well with the relentless difficulty. This is a world where every inanimate object has angry eyes, gyrates constantly like it's busting for a piss, and desperately wants you dead. Which is just as well, because you'll have obliged them several hundred times before the game is done. Gameplay-wise, the closest comparison I can think of is Fury, in that the game consists mainly of a string of multi-stage boss fights with elements of bullet hell, in which you must balance pouring damage into the enemy against avoiding the damage that pours out of them. The difference is, in Fury you had a big sword and a mysterious backstory and could regain health from therapeutically twatting people, while in Cuphead you have a cup for a head. They can take a total of three hits before it shatters as assuredly as to a pushed off desk by the naughty cat of archetype, and you have to start again. There's also a fairly centralised two-player co-op mode I'm in two minds about. On the one hand it seems like it'd be dramatically easier, since you're doing twice the damage with twice the targets and one player can even save another player from death. That seems weighed excessively against the lonely shadows of the world, whose best friends and sex partners are attached to the ends of their wrists. But then again, it means you have to keep track of a few more of the several hundred moving objects on screen at any one time, so maybe it balances out. And besides, a proper bollock tussler of a challenge is something to be enjoyed like a fine wine. And personally I wouldn't drink from a glass of wine with another person, that seems like a good way to make a mess and engender unwanted sexual tension. The secret of enjoying gonad distressingly hard games is to not give up, because I guarantee you'll find a hundred things to complain about while you're struggling with a boss. Like how you die fifty times fighting, say, a giant hole punch with angry eyes, before you finally squeak past its first two stages with one health left, whereupon the hole punch turns into a fucking Power Shred 64 CB paper shredder and you die instantly to its innovative jam blocker technology. It can seem very unfair that you've worked so hard to memorise the best way to avoid the first two stages attacks, only for them to be replaced by completely different attacks that you must now figure out in your estimated 12 nanoseconds of remaining life will start all over again. The music's pissing you off and your eyes hurt and that fucking pirate has twice as much health as every other boss, I fucking swear, and you're pretty sure you're going to write down some very harsh swear words when you come to do the review, but then all of a sudden you enter a sort of cosmic state of hyper-awareness and beat the boss perfectly, and it's like someone's lifted a whale off your lower back and you just feel serene, until the game grades you with a C-, minus. but honestly stick your grades up your ass, Cuphead, I'm happy and I won't have to beat my kids tonight. See, if I'd stopped because I was frustrated or because I should have walked the dog two hours ago, I'd only have been left with bad feelings and a pissy carpet. I'd have gone to bed that night with that fucking music stuck in my head and woken up the next morning with teeth marks all over my pillow, mattress and spouse. So it's important to put complaints about the game in the proper context. Yes, it's frustrating, that's the whole point, it needs to be for the payoff. But it's not just challenge that gives Cuphead its weirdly hypnotic draw, because there was another, um, cullion traumatisingly hard game that came out last week. Ruiner it was called, and I didn't like it very much. It seemed like a cyberpunk ripoff of Hotline Miami with none of what made Hotline Miami interesting, like the psychedelic imagery or the fast pace or the not taking place in a succession of the most obvious fucking environments imaginable and then trying to make them less obvious by illuminating them like a fucking ghost train ride. Yeah, the fights were hard, but I wasn't getting that all-important sense of payoff. All I felt I was earning was more chances to fight boring gang members in murky environments. That's the cuphead difference. Its utterly unique style makes it an instant breath of fresh air, even if that breath of fresh air also contains a thousand stinging hornets. And you tank the stings just to see what it's going to belch up next. It's like being stabbed to death by Dick Van Dyke. Yes it hurts, and it's probably not good for you, but you can't stay mad. It's too adorable how he thinks he can do a cockney accent. Okay Arts, you can do this one more week before the big releases start, and then you can stop pretending anyone gives a shit about indie Oh hello there viewers! I noticed that Steam has had another bountiful week of dry looking strategy games and upbeat cartoon pornography. Let's look at a couple of games that were neither of those things and so leapt out at me like a half-killed grasshopper from the mouth of an unwarrantedly self-satisfied cat. Hob was the first, a minimalist but effective name bringing to mind folklore, gas cookers and popular brands of oat biscuit. It's a hack and slashy explorer sort of thing with something halfway between a top-down and isometric viewpoint like the camera's glued to a drunk seagull that was recommended to me because ooh Yahtzee we know how much you like your atmospheric exploration games and your dialogue free storytelling. It's true, I do, I'm just not so keen on story free storytelling as a concept. The premise of Hob is you're one of those mysterious wanderer types wearing a red hood and a cloak because don't they fucking always, and you're following around Bastion from Overwatch who seems to think it's jolly important that you run around a ruined city turning all the lights back on. What are we, the fucking caretakers? A jobbing door-to-door -door electrician business? With no dialogue we might as well assume as much. Hob does do a good job of executing what it sets out to do, the air of wandering adventure, of secret purpose, of boredom, of exploring the ruins of strongholds and cities once mighty if boring, atmospheric, boring, boring, boringly boring. Don't misunderstand me, Hob. It sounds like you think I'm boring, Yards. Alright, I guess you haven't misunderstood me. Yes! It's well put together, has probably added some impressive stuff to the concept artist's portfolio, and will probably take home the ooh bless them aren't they trying so hard best indie game award from a regional game dev convention, but haven't we been here many times before? Explore the remnants of the ancient advanced civilization that now manifests as a load of partial walls and bits of statue jutting up from the overgrown foliage, the lone wanderer wandering lonesomely, all silence but for the wind, the understated sad music and the grunts of primitive monsters that now use the place for their girl guide meetings. It's Breath of the Wild, it's Metroid Prime, it's Journey, it's every bloody Team Ico game, and I was distinctly ungripped 
it. Maybe I get enough sense of lonely atmosphere from looking at my social calendar. So I also downloaded another game later in the week that had some ominous red flags about it called A Hat in Time. Firstly, the title's rubbish. A Hat in Time. A Hat in Time. Just saying the words feels like I'm biting down on the side of a plastic cup. Also, it's a kickstarted project that pledges to evoke the spirit of retro 3D platformers and that rang particular alarm bells, which sounded like this. Ukulele, ukulele. But what the hell, it was this or hire a speed metal guitarist to keep me awake through the rest of Hob. A Hat in Time is about a rather alarmingly unsupervised little girl in a series of hats exploring a fantastic world of adventure to find fuel for her spaceship. Since she starts the game in bed, probably safe to assume this is all a dream, or perhaps that she's descending into fantasy in the last few moments of brain activity before dying of starvation or neglect in a forgotten hospital basement. Blimey, that was uncalled for, and completely contrary to the spirit of A Hat in Time, which is nice and lively and upbeat, and I enjoyed it quite a lot. Which came as a relief, because you may recall last week I was concerned that only liking miserable violent games was flagging me as a candidate to be reprogrammed by the CIA for political assassinations. A Hat in Time cites Super Mario Sunshine as an influence, and that's pretty clear from how you repeatedly go to big hub levels to attempt different challenges, the nuanced platforming mechanics that starts with a jump and turns into a double jump, a dive, a wall run, denial, bargaining and finally acceptance that we're going to have to fall into the lava now. It's even got those pure platforming interlude levels that Mario Sunshine had that are like we dropped acid and stuck our head in a bucket of Duplo. But A Hat in Time also can't seem to hold a single idea in its head for very long. We establish the Mario Sunshine tribute in the first hub world, but then it throws its toys out of the pram and goes, I'm bored, I want to do a tightly scripted intrigue set in a movie studio for owls that's closer in tone to something from a Paper Mario game. Alright, is this the sort of thing you want to be sticking with now, Hat in Time? No, I want to do some horror out of fucking nowhere. No way, I want to do a free roamy platforming world as well. Christ, this is like getting the current president to type up his fucking manifesto. But it succeeds where ukulele failed because it keeps the pace up and has some decent funny writing that can be self-aware without having to constantly suck its own dick for being so clever and physically flexible. The first obvious comparison between Hob and A Hat in Time is that both of them seem to treat standard combat like some unwanted dullard colleague who reliably brings the mood down at every fucking office party but they have to keep him around because he knows the Wi-Fi password. In Hatty Time it's just a matter of pressing the homing attack button whenever something waddles up wanting to start something, and in Hob you just get set upon by nearby wildlife on your way to pressing the next button. Well you see that's what the core mechanic of Hob appears to be. You press a button, a huge piece of ancient machinery slides into or out of something, and now you have to figure out where the next button you have just opened access to is. It's like trying to bring off a lady in a pitch black room wearing very complicated underpants. Hattie Boom Batty isn't above having a lot of missions where the goal is go to the place and get the thing. In fact when you need to find four hidden keys for a door or whatever, the game just gives you a bunch of glowing lines leading to directly where they are, just in case you were worried there'd be an ounce of challenge involved. But then you look away for one second to roll your eyes at your Twitch followers and the game knees you in the toddler activity centre with surprisingly difficult boss fights. See, Hob is the more tightly designed experience, it's clearly got all its ends tied up and its cracks diligently sealed. I mean, in Hat in Time I managed to drop out of the map more than once from staring at an exterior wall too hard. Also, Hat in Time isn't very long, it's only got four worlds and an end boss and only 40 shine sprites, I mean time pieces, to get, which by standard measures puts it at 1.1 Demi Marios. But there's a simple metric to determine which game is best. I woke up on Thursday morning thinking, oh Christ, I suppose I should play more of that boring Hob game today. Oh well, maybe I'll find a piece of forgotten architecture that looks vaguely like a tit. Whereas I woke up on Friday morning thinking, oh boy, I get to play more Hattie time today. I hope I get to jump on a penguin. I play Hob and I stroke my chin and think, hmm, yes, very atmospheric. What an artful tacit lesson on the excesses of civilization. And then I play Hattie time and conversely feel like I'm having fun. Fun? Fun, fun. Oh yes, I remember that. Isn't that the thing we're not supposed to have anymore? That's supposed to disappear on our 25th birthday to be replaced by very serious concerns about fiscal stability? In Practical Fantasy Helmets Off to Monolith, the first Shadow of Mordor was a damn good game in the face of impossible odds. Not only a movie tie-in, not only adapting a seminal work of fantasy fiction that certain kinds of obsessive nerds take more seriously than personal hygiene, but also being a AAA sandbox game in an age when such things are thicker on the ground than horny spinsters at a suburban wedding. And with a generically broody and vengeful protagonist with all the dynamic characterization of a potato with angry eyes drawn on it, come to think of it, why did I like Shadow of Mordor? A question that haunted me, as I started up the sequel, Middle Earth Shadow of War, and throughout most of the first act. Talion, above mentioned grizzled hero type whose name sounds like it could be a Middle Earth euphemism for penis, is still trapped in a loveless marriage with the ghost of an elven warlord bastard, who back in the day thought it would be a wizzo idea to help out someone called the Dark Lord Sauron with a custom jewellery project. Talion and Celebrimbor start the game where the last one left off, deciding to fight evil mind-controlling wedding bands with evil mind-controlling wedding bands. But it's okay, the new ring they create is a nice ring, you can tell because it's got blue rather than orange LEDs on it, and it's full of nice occult powers that only does the nice kind of conquest and subjugation. That's why it's almost immediately stolen by Shelob, because she wants to do lots of nice things with it, like throw tea parties and send letters of encouragement to depressed elderly people in veterans hospitals. Oh yeah, by the way, Shelob is a pretty lady now. You might think you know differently if you've read the books or seen the films where she had more of a rampaging giant spider thing going on, but don't be such a prig. She's still a giant spider, but now she can be a pretty lady as well, okay? Who can see the future and forges uneasy alliances with passing half-ghost grizzly swordsmen in order to clandestinely pull strings in pursuit of some unknowable long-term goal. Yeah, that grand strategic cunning was 
really coming across in The Return of the King, when she was screechingly chasing after some hobbits in a cave, when she was having trouble chowing down on the fat one because he hit upon the equally cunning strategy of getting out of the way. Just as well we're not here for the story, I suppose, although someone should probably have told Monolith that, because the game gleefully wastes our time with it for fucking hours before we get the ring back and finally return to the high spot the last game left us on, and which should have been this game's starting point, hanging around armies of unique individualised orcs, with the ability to selectively take over their minds and overpower their free will, in a nice way, remember? And only then did I recall why I'd made Shadow of Mordor my game of the year back in the day. I just love what they've done with these orcs! They took this race of evil red shirts bred only to fight, ever a stupid concept because you can't only be fighters, someone's got to build all the huts and fences and sew everyone's trousers together, and gave them actual depth. I even overheard a conversation in this game. Incidentally, the orcs are right up there with Arkham City's thugs in terms of overheard chatter, and I'm pretty sure have a lot of the same voice actors, in which two worker orcs were trying to convince each other that carpentry is basically the same as fighting when you think about it. See, the orcs are self-aware, they're funny, they're all unique, and yet we stab them up by the hundreds while motherfucking Tallywhacker gets to be the hero. Talk about injustice! But there's got to be something new for the organic orc politics simulator or we might as well just be playing the first game except with a few additional years of cynicism and reduced faith in humanity. And while fighting them hasn't changed much at all, some of them are weak to arrows, some to fire, some of them are scared of flies, some of them are scared of public speaking so you have to do a grab attack and throw them on stage at the Academy Awards, but now you have to work more closely with the orcs as a personal army rather than a network of sleeper agents, occupying fortresses and employing specific ones as bodyguards, and that leads to all kinds of new surprises. Maybe you'll try to summon your bodyguard and some enemy captain shows up instead, waving your bodyguard's willy on a lanyard. Or your bodyguard does show up, but he betrays you because he's sick of having to worry about people putting his willy on things. It's easy to feel overpowered when you can stealth kill three guys at once and insta-kill counter all their remaining mates, but then the game throws a surprise captain ambush at you and you're desperately trying to remember the unwashed shower room floor attack because you're pretty sure this captain is only weak to Verukas. Although one thing I could do without is the way every captain has to give a fucking acceptance speech when they arrive, and you and all the orcs you were in the middle of fighting to the death have to stand still and listen to a paragraph of threatening banter they've probably been rehearsing for days. And now I'm wondering who the fuck's educating these orcs, because one of them in their opening remarks knew what a fucking metaphor was. Are there orc liberal arts professors somewhere assuring each other that stamping out ignorance of advanced language techniques is also basically the same as fighting? Anyway, with the organic fun of working away at orc command structures in preparation for fortress takeovers, the actual story quests almost feel like an imposition, as they handhold you through some consequence-free generic scripted encounters and a boss fight with the Balrog for basically no reason except they needed something to put in the trailers. Having said that, the main story has a couple of neat twists that I won't spoil, not that you care, do you? What you really want to hear about are the fucking micropayments and if they mean we should string some or all of the Warner Brothers up over a penful of hungry dogs with a big in strip lodged between each toe. Of course, the publishers have been quick to tell us that you don't need them to beat the game and you can certainly get through the main story without them. whoop de fucking do publishers. An owl in a body cast could get through story missions. The wall I ran into was after I'd taken all the fortresses but was suddenly obliged to defend them all from besieging attackers. Now, some of these forts I'd taken quite a ways back in the game, so all the orcs I'd left defending the place were around level 20, but the besieging orcs were all around level 40 up. Christ knows where they came from. Last I checked, I ran all the orc fortresses in the fucking country. Maybe they were trained by those secret guerrilla liberal arts professors. But even though I'd done all the side missions by this point, barring finding collectibles, but maybe you misunderstood me when I said I play video games to have fun, Monolith, I did not have enough in-game currency to buy all the fort upgrades I needed to defend myself. I'm sure just one little micropayment could have made the difference, but this is how it starts, isn't it? Oh, it's all optional, Yards. But what the fuck does optional mean? It's video games. Playing them at all is optional. Sticking a broom handle up your ass is optional. Doesn't mean I wouldn't really like to do it. Like a serial bike thief who lives next door to a pawn shop, history often runs in cycles. The last time a game called The Evil Within came out in mid-October around the same time as a Middle Earth game and a Call of Duty game, it was a survival horror adventure that played out like someone had Google image searched the word horror and then used that as the fucking storyboard. It had creepy hospitals, zombies, mad scientists, massacres involving chainsaws in places reminiscent of Texas, and was on the whole about as cohesive and well-structured as a puddle of monkey vomit. Let's see if it does any better with The Evil Within 2, still a bit of evil in there, better run it through the dishwasher again. Things do seem a touch more focused right off the bat because the plot zeroes in on the main character Sebastian Caster what's it and his tragic backstory that the first game only briefly explored. Ha ha! Actually, I was lying there, I don't remember the first game exploring his tragic backstory much at all. But you believed me when I said it did, didn't ya? Shows how fucking generic, a gritty, cynical, burnt-out detective protagonist he is. I said he's got a tragic backstory and you all went, pfft, well, obviously. Anyway, yes, turns out Sebastian's haunted by his daughter dying in a house fire years ago, but now it turns out she wasn't. Actually, she was kidnapped by one of those credibility-pushingly evil megacorporations that are a signature of Japanese survival horrors because they wanted to use her mind to create a virtual world like the one in the first first game. Please note that they didn't do this because Sebastian survived the first game, or to get any kind of leverage over him, it's all just a massive coincidence. Long story short, something's going wrong with the virtual world and they send Sebastian in to find his daughter and give her a damn good spanking until it starts working properly again. So we can add The Evil Within 2 to the stable of Yummy Hairy Dad games, in which we play a hairy dad in remarkably good shape, protecting and or saving their child or child surrogate. Reference The Last of Us, Bioshock Infinite, the upcoming God of War, and so on. Seems to be popular with AAA story games these days because it's a slightly more PC alternative to rescuing princesses with the tacit understanding that they'll handle our scepter and orbs in gratitude.
attitude. But if you ask me, this is just swapping one unrealistic fantasy for another. Rather than the male fantasy of big titty action ladies, it's the female fantasy of men actually being, you know, responsible and shit. Last time, my problem with the story was that the world had no physical coherence. You just randomly warp from horrible place to horrible place with no idea of how or if you were getting closer to victory. This complaint appears to have been addressed. It's established that the evil megacorp has somehow built an entire coherent town in our kid's noggin, but parts of it are being corrupted by psychos. So now we do have a sense that our physical location actually matters, but the plot's still a mess. We establish a main villain, have a boss fight with him, then he goes, by the way I'm working for someone else who hasn't been mentioned or established in the slightest, but he's the main villain now. Oh no, I'm dead. Blech. Also, the relationship between real and virtual worlds confuses me. Everyone in the virtual world has a body in the real world, right? So why is Sebastian the only one we see in the plug-in room? Why doesn't our contact on the outside just go to the bodies of the troublemakers and stick an ice pick up their nose? We help one bloke escape the virtual world, but how did that work? They escaped, woke up in the real world facility, then politely asked the mega corporation not to immediately shoot them in the face? Besides the yummy hairy dad factor, the glaring change to the evil within formula is that it now has some sandbox elements, because AAA gaming these days is like hippopotamus taxidermy. There's always room for more fucking sand. Well I say sandbox, all they do is give you an open-ended map to explore on your way to the next story mission and add precisely one side mission to do. Fair play though, you can explore a surprisingly large number of houses in town, but that means they all have to contain a little something, and I found that I was never really running low on anything, which makes it not so much survival horror as try to stay awake horror. I only ever used healing items because I was full up on them and had just found a new one lying around. True, you can't hold very many bullets because Sebastian needs the room in his pockets for Kinder Surprise toys and jars of snot, but you can always craft yourself some more as long as you've got gunpowder. There's no limit on how much gunpowder you can have and the enemies and environments seem to dispense the stuff the way your bottom dispenses farts during a sensitive evening with the in-laws. Also, the monsters patrolling the streets don't seem to respawn automatically, which on the one hand is good because it gives a sense of progress and avoids wasting ammo, but on the other hand it sucks all the tension out of exploring the neighbourhood and turns it into trick-or-treating for fucking scrap metal. Alternatively, don't even bother killing enemies because they seem to have the visibility range of a Metal Gear Solid guard on a high smog day and you can just scuttle through the hedgerows like a lost crab. Having said all that, getting into combat can be a bit difficult early on. Sneaking up on monsters for the stealth kill is surprisingly hard because they're always looking around in weird jerky ways like they just heard a police siren and want to make sure their crystal meth is still there, so it's hard to know what constitutes behind them. Also, Sebastian is one of those prima donna protagonists who just refuses to do anything while they're still winding down from the previous animation. It's very important that after he shakes off a grab attack he slowly return his arms to his sides before he can do anything about that other monster coming up on his flank with an axe and a hard on. Yeah, I hear you desperately mashing buttons, there is such a thing as decorum. If the first evil within had a strength, besides colour matching very well with a hospital corridor full of rusty farming equipment, it was in the visuals and the creativity in the monster design and horror set pieces. Yeah, it's not a particularly new idea to make a monster out of mashing lots of dead bodies together, but you can't deny it's effective. And while it's broadly speaking more together as a game and as a story, the Evil Within 2 feels comparatively generic. Let's go through the boss fights to prove my point, because that's where the creativity is supposed to be on display. First you fight a smash together from bodies boss, with a bit of that Japanese ghost thing going on where they're one change of lighting away from being in a shampoo advert, so that's the baseline, that's pH neutral. But then you fight a bloke in a blue suit. After that the next main villain's boss fight is just a sample platter of bosses from the last game, which is cheating, so no points there. And finally, giant angry corpse. Still, what could you expect? The virtual world gave them an excuse for literally infinite creativity and all they made was a bog-standard midwestern town. Bad enough to make a corporation's evil without being boring as well. Ooh no, we can't make all the buildings out of gingerbread, what would market research say? They'd say, chomp chomp, yum yum. Mario having always rampantly and eagerly put his face on things like a very affectionate and itchy cat, I think it's fair to say that the phrase Mario game has lost whatever meaning it ever had. Even before that whole rabbits business, one can now officially expect from a Mario game anything from turn-based combat to sports simulators to typing tutor to Nintendo branded moustache shaving kit, and I feel like we're gonna have to come up with a new name for what I hesitantly call proper Mario games, as in a platformer in which we chase a princess stealing lizard through a highly circuitous path of themed worlds, wrestle with the finer points of the triple jump and devastate the landscape with the unyielding force of our mighty Italian buttocks. Let's call it a Mario Gammon Soiree. Super Mario Odyssey is a new Mario Gammon Soiree, and I guess we know what that means. Nintendo are turning a profit this year! Yes! I know some Japanese salarymen who'll be drinking irresponsibly tonight. All of them, as usual, but that's besides the point. Mario Odyssey knows why we're all here and wastes no fucking time, with the game literally starting mid-Princess Kidnap. You see, the plot is driven by Bowser travelling the world gathering the essentials for his fairy tale wedding ceremony, which is very adorable. Bowser's a properly raised fire-breathing lizard tyrant, he's not gonna father a bastard rape baby. How would he explain that to his parents? Shortly, Mario is left in the dirt and meets the inevitable magical spirit character that basically acts as glorified mouse pointer, the star child in Mario Galaxy, the butterfly thing in Super Paper Mario, the Roomba from the Rabbids thing. This time it's a magic hat, and as has been well documented, if Mario throws the magic hat at a living thing that isn't already wearing a hat, then Mario parasitizes their body and overwrites their free will like a cordyceps fungus with a slightly racist accent. The levels are more on the Mario 64, Mario Sunshine side of things than the Mario Galaxy approach, large hub levels rather than a sequence of contained challenges that you must shake down for magic stars by probing their every secret crevice. Oh wait, it's not stars we're collecting for once, it's moons! Who says Nintendo never innovate? Well, the level themes for starters, you guessed it, it's the classic ditty, grasslands, desert, ocean, jungle, ice world, fire world, boss. It's even got all the usual wild cards thrown in as well, city world, spooky world, and food world. Although food world manifests as vegetable and healthy snack world rather than the usual candy 
City World, maybe Nintendo were feeling the pressure from child obesity groups. Incidentally, the mayor of City World is Pauline, who may be the same one from Donkey Kong, but I'm not sure they ever directly admit that. Probably a hard thing to bring up in casual conversation. Hey, sorry if this sounds weird, but didn't I rescue you from a monkey? This is the same City World that's populated with realistically proportioned humans, by the way, which for me raises the question of what the fuck Mario is, if not a human like these lads. Some frighteningly malformed species of hairy pygmy? It's one of the things that underline how Mario is now essentially just a brand with no consistent tone that can be put alongside literally anything without a blink. See also the realistic dinosaur we possess in the first world for all of two minutes, I suspect, just so they could put it in the fucking trailer. And a strange interlude late in the game wherein Bowser shows up riding a fucking Dark Souls boss. I guess it's not really a complaint, it's just not fair on other games that work jolly hard to keep a consistent visual tone. You wouldn't see Dark Souls introduce cartoon mushroom people out of nowhere. <coughs> Moving on. Not much to complain about gameplay-wise, you've got your jump, your slightly higher jump, your other slightly higher jump, your third slightly higher jump that you do from a crouch, the fourth slightly higher jump you do right after a butt stomp, the fifth slightly higher jump you save for family occasions and bar mitzvahs, so if you've played Mario Galaxy you should settle back in quick, and you'll be relieved to know that you no longer have to shake a Wiimote to attack like you're trying to give yourself tendinitis. Not that Nintendo have entirely undug their heels from the motion controls filth. Hey, don't forget you can shake the controller to climb poles a bit faster and throw your hat a bit differently and various other non-essential things. I hadn't forgotten, thanks Nintendo. You're gonna do it then, hadn't planned to Nintendo. Okay, I'll just remind you again next time you fucking blink. In fairness, I suppose shaking the controller to climb faster makes some sense since it's the sort of thing you might do if you're frustrated and in a hurry. Maybe next Nintendo could make a controller that can detect when you're swearing at it, or when you're two minutes late for your appointment at the SDI clinic. All in all, the game is as fun, playable and full of variety as one should expect from Mario Gammon Soiree, but the question for me is, have we surpassed Mario Galaxy? The erstwhile peak of Gammon Soiree, as going to space often is, Jason Voorhees can attest, and as often follows a high, everything since then has been a sort of haze of come down and self-indulgence for old stashy bollocks. True, Galaxy was a lot more linear and suffered from that tendinitis business, but if you want to see self-indulgence then Mario Odyssey spurts it out in long ropey strands with both fists. It being a modern Nintendo game and therefore enamoured with nostalgia for itself, there's a self-congratulatory air to the whole thing that at times is good and makes things come alive, like the big musical number in the city level, another thing conspicuously present in the trailer, and that other times tries my patience a bit, like when it goes back to a 2D 8-bit Mario and it all feels kind of regressive. Deliberately so, I'm aware, but still cheap. Ah, uh, you don't want to listen to a 30-year-old man pontificating on where this cartoon game for Kiddiewinks belongs in the history of modern culture because he lacks the qualifications for any serious field of criticism, do you, madam? You want to know if Mario Odyssey will keep little Jimmy and little Susie off your back for five minutes? And that brings me to the two-player mode, for as well as being serial masturbators, Nintendo are also big on the family fun time angle, so you'll notice an option for two players in the pause menu, but don't fall for it, this is a highway to acrimonious divorce. See, one player controls Mario and the other controls the magic hat, and all you have to do is make use of the Miracle of Switch hardware, just snap the controller in half and hey presto, the game's fucking unplayable. Firstly, the Joy-Cons are so fucking tiny it's like trying to fluff an elderly hamster, and secondly there's only one stick so you can't move your character and the camera at the same time, which it turns out is pretty bloody important when you're trying to accurately land on things in 3D. There are even challenges like the races that will flat out turn you away at the fucking door if you're not playing solo, so Mario Galaxy's on top there at least, because as humiliating as it was for the second player, who was basically doing nothing but pick up the main player's litter and flicked bogeys, they were still only being a help. Force little Jimmy to interrupt his moon collecting to let little Susie join in, madam, and ain't no one gonna be collecting shit except things to discuss with their future prison therapist. So we're one third of the way through the multiple fucking big name games that came out on October 27th, or as it came to be known, let's all piss on Yahtzee's schedule day, and I might as well admit that I did Mario Odyssey first because on the face that seemed the most likely to give a positive experience. Much as I enjoyed Wolfenstein The New Order, with its strong characters and putting Nazis in their place, that place being face down in a toilet trying to breathe their own wee-wee, I was iffy about the whole idea of a sequel. The New Order, in which an ageing and weary BJ Blazkowicz is stuck in a global techno-Nazi future where the Nazis will keep coming forever and there will never be enough wee-wee to go around, was a truly refreshing take on the World War II action shooter and to my mind would have been a very fitting send-off for a stale and oversaturated genre. Although I guess what with the new Call of Duty this month it didn't quite send it off as hard as I would have liked. Refreshing, yes, but the thing about that kind of unexpected lightning bolt of a game is that it's a Pandora's box that can only be opened once. Open it again and you're just putting wear and tear on the hinges. Blowjob Blazkowicz, far from the smirking super killer of older iterations, is now a dried up overused Stretch Armstrong doll in the rowdy daycare centre of the universe, who has an increasingly ridiculous talent for coming back from serious injury but isn't quite returning back to his old shape each time. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that he survived getting his liberty bells blown off at the end of the last game and journeys to America with his ragtag band of rebels to win back his homeland from the Nazis with nothing but gumption, a gigantic untraceable submarine, several nuclear warheads and the magical wonder technology of an ancient secret society. Forgive me if it seems like we're losing a sense of threat and adversity, especially when Blowjob continues to shrug off injury in ways that push credibility, even beyond the usual video game protagonist baseline where we can come back from multiple gunshot wounds by sucking up an entire breakfast table like a Jones in crack or five minutes before the bus leaves. There's one moment in particular, and I'm sure you know the one I mean if you've played the game, wherein credibility is pushed right out the door of a passenger airliner and how the fuck are we supposed to take any threat seriously after that? So someone on the dev team must have said, how do we follow a game like New Order? And someone else said, well I think the most important thing is that it not look like we're trying too hard. And they certainly pulled that off like superstars, I might almost have thought they weren't fucking trying at all. You remember how at one point in the last game we had to go to a Nazi moon base and it was like 
like the ultimate escalation of ridiculousness, and you wondered how you could possibly top that. Well, in the new Colossus, we get to go to a Nazi base on Venus, which is totally different to a moon base in a number of ways that I'm sure Bethesda will be happy to list for you if you all ring them up at three in the morning. We're even going there for the exact same sodding reason we went to the moon base to get some control codes for something on Earth that are so vital and important that the Nazis keep them as far away from where they'd be useful as it is possible for them to be. You have no trouble getting there, and once you're done, you're back on Earth inside a 30 second cutscene. It's not exactly the stuff of Flash Gordon Sunday strips, but it's not the only point that feels like we're repeating ourselves. Seems like all the struggle and surprises were in the last game, and now we're just doing admin. And then, just when the plot finally seems to be warming up to go somewhere interesting, the game abruptly ends. Guess they think they can stretch this out to a trilogy, so tune in for Wolfenstein 3, where presumably we'll get to visit the Nazi Andromeda galaxy for precisely one mission, and BJ will survive getting his entire body pushed through a cattle grid. It's a shame, because the story was the New Order's strong point. Oh yes, if you hate cutscenes interrupting the action, then you're in the wrong tortuously plonged id software franchise, matey. Doom is your pot of jam. The plot's not great, but plot's just one part of story, and New Order's characters, setting, dialogue, and world building were all great. New Colossus still has its moments, I might as well spoil now that Hitler shows up, but you don't get to kill him. And not getting to kill Hitler in a Wolfenstein game is like hiring an expensive prostitute to come to your hotel room and massage your kneecaps. So with the story not quite carrying things as well as the New Orders did, we are forced to pay more attention to the gameplay and conclude that it's not actually that great. As always, I prefer taking the stealthy option in your standard play-it-your-way combat buffet, but the stealth is like a blatantly rigged carny game where the cans are glued together and the goldfish have all died anyway. It's the shitty kind of stealth where every motherfucker on the map instantly knows your position and least favourite place to be shot in because you moved one quarter inch out of cover to look around and were spotted by someone's hamster. Thus begins the Cock Up Cascade, and I hate Cock Up Cascade because it feels like being unduly and continuously punished for making one tiny mistake. The commanders also instantly know where you are and will continually respawn back up until you storm their office and chop all their arms and legs off, like the exact opposite of the smooth unrattled secret agent you ostensibly are. Now I'm sure one could make a perfectly reasonable argument that maybe a game where we play as a bloke built like a 1950s vending machine who has the option of dual wielding automatic shotguns and where the environment has more food and health items lying around than a church harvest festival after a staggeringly successful guilt trip doesn't actually intend you to take the stealthy route. But if that's the case, why even have a stealthy route? Grow some fucking balls, Wolfenstein. If it's not the intended experience, leave it out, and concentrate on making the gunplay fun. This is just cruel to someone like me, who likes stealth gameplay, it's holding the squeaky mouse just slightly out of reach of my little paws. If it is the big penis shooty action that's supposed to carry things, impressive as it is to carry things with your big penis, then our health seems to get sucked away really fucking fast in an open cock-up cascade scenario, and I feel like there's not much variety to the enemies. I guess Nazi and giant robot suit is a concept that can only go so far. And I'm sure there were better ways to ramp things up for a final boss fight than two Nazis in particularly giant robot suits. In brief, Wolfenstein the New Colossus couldn't recapture the impact of Wolfenstein the New Order, perhaps changing more than one sodding word in the title could have been a better start, and is content to merely spin its wheels until we're either bored or we've undermined every theme the first game had. I mean, Blowjob Blasty Bum was almost heartbreakingly sympathetic in New Order, but somehow the same personality was trying my patience after everything he survived by the end of this one. Ooh, woe is me, my shrapnel wounds hurt. Perhaps soon the day will come when I can only manage four dead Nazis for breakfast. And so we reach the third game that came out on Let's All Piss in Each Other's Mouths Day, the one that I was hotly anticipating with very familiar feelings of exhausted dread. Yes, it's the new Sasso Credo, Sasso Credo Rigi Roggi. Assassin's Creed is a once interesting historical adventure series that became part of the collective Ubisoft sandbox, a sort of amorphous blob of mediocrity that comes around to haunt us every year or so, like a monster from a lower rent Stephen King book. It went on a bit of a hiatus to see if it could find a way to recapture the magic, and after two years of thinking very hard, this is what they've come up with a prequel with the subtitle Origins. Whoever's job it is to prevent the Ubisoft creative team from committing mass suicide, they cannot possibly be getting paid enough. I was about to make some joke along the lines of when can we expect Assassin's Creed Reloaded and Assassin's Creed Revelations, because I genuinely forgot they'd already done that one. No hiatus was going to be long enough, because even without Sasso Credo, the Ubisoft sandbox has continued to come around, continually larger and more betentacled than before, to steal our cattle and cause our pregnant women to miscarry, and of course AAA gaming as a whole has long been firing off miscarriages like a nightmarish 21 gun salute. AAA games are now merely platforms for blatant attempts to fleece money from colossal dimwits that somehow have financial independence despite not being able to open a tin of beans without losing an eye. And then the publishers will say, hey, just because we erected a giant sign saying please jump off this cliff and dash yourselves to death on the jagged rocks below doesn't mean you have to do that. Granted, but I object to the way most of the game takes place in the shadow of the giant sign and the rest of it is spent perched astride the giant sign. What I mean is Assassin's Creed Origins is one of those AAA terminal cases where everything seems to have been built around the giant cliff jumping sign as an afterthought. Firstly, it's got all the usual variables, character levels and XP, in-game currency, weapon upgrades, crafting items, because of course the more things you can quantify, the more imaginary prizes you can put in a loop box. The more you can base the gameplay around making numbers bigger and hypnotise the players into wanting a weapon identical to their current weapon, except with a whole two numbers bigger, more than they want their next fucking meal. I can't think of what other purpose giving every character a level could possibly have. It's certainly catastrophic for immersion, when anything more than two levels higher than you will just mash you into a fine paste, even if you do get a stealth attack on them. One would think a hidden blade to the windpipe would be a pretty decisive argument ended no matter how many press-ups they did that morning. Also, it means that you can't just stick to story missions because they don't provide nearly enough XP brand flakes to keep you regular, so you've got to side quest a bit, but are restricted to a tiny pool of side quests for your current level.
level, as lower level ones don't provide enough XP to be worth the effort, and higher level ones are like trying to trim your pubes with an angle grinder. So much for the fucking go anywhere sandbox. But then these haven't been sandbox games in a long time, have they? Minecraft is a sandbox. What Ubisoft calls a sandbox these days is an unholy mashup of open world, RPG, MMO, and side activity amounting to go to icon on map and press contextual button, closer in spirit to data entry than action adventure, and they make the games like that because the accounting department says they have to. As I say, the plot almost feels like an afterthought. We are Bayek of Siwa, an ancient Egyptian policeman type thing who's very cross because his spin the wheel of motivation son was killed by proto-templars, and also because his people are being oppressed, but which one he's the most cross about varies depending on what the current mission needs him to do. We don't know his backstory at first because the game starts mid-assassination and Bayek has a great big fill-in backstory later note pinned to his head because I guess the accounting department said the action had to kick in straight away. From there it's a fairly typical Assassin's Creed plot progression, travel the world map stabbing anyone who openly sneers at a member of the working class, participate in a dramatisation of some historical events that the average shithead could be trusted to know about with some kind of ridiculous action sequence contrived into it. In this case the seduction of Julius Caesar by Cleopatra, which at one point features Bayek and Caesar in a high speed car chase like it's a fucking mismatched buddy cop drama by way of a Bill and Ted film. Don't expect this being ostensibly the origin story of the Assassin Order to mix up the formula much. I remember feeling profoundly disappointed at the scene when Bayek's missus gives him a hidden blade and says, this is a weapon from ancient times. Bitch, we're in ancient times! I wanted to know who built these fucking things, and why they didn't fall apart the instant an Italian teenager got his greasy hands on them 1400 years from now. Standard combat in Sasso Creedy Ridgy is definitely tacking to the RPG side of things, it's now a sort of very watery version of Dark Souls combat where enemies glide around the arena like they've got paint rollers for feet, and the charged strong attack beats basically everything. Gone is the Arkham Asylum style counter combat, you remember counter combat as that thing that requires a certain amount of skill. You remember skill as that thing that mattered before the main deciding factor was who's got the highest number. And speaking of tacking, every now and again you get to play as by ex misses doing ship combat missions, which I find mystifying. Does Ubisoft think we now expect Assassin's Creed to have ship combat? Just because Black Flag had it and it was a little beacon of joy and light glimmering all too briefly from inside Ubisoft's churning mass? Because I don't want your ship combat if you're just cynically crowbarring it in like a nice ball of glittery tinfoil to look at while we're getting sodomized over the recycle bin. And now a list of things I liked about Sack of Greasy Oranges. Don't worry, it's brief. Scenery is nice. Um, removing the minimap and getting by on scouting with the eagle works pretty well, although it does make it way too easy to mark targets. And even without the minimap, the quantifying of everything means the screen's still sprinkled in bullshit. Oh, how embarrassing! This list of things I like has somehow turned into more gripes. Look, I'm not mad at you, Assassin's Creed Origins, I'm just disappointed. And bored. Mostly bored. I might have had a better time if the game had let me speed through the story campaign instead of forcing me to grind up dull, repetitive side quests to reach the minimum level for the next main mission. I don't like the feeling that the game is fighting with me to stop me getting what I want out of it. Actually, maybe I am mad at you, Assassin's Creed Origins. Origins, I'm so sick of all this. I'm sick of playing AAA games that feel like they exist not because a creator had a vision and an idea that excited them, but because quarterly income projections needed to be met. It's like Blackbeard going into stock market fraud. Yeah, it's more lucrative, but there's no freedom or adventure, and they won't let you carve tits on the figurehead. Sonic Mania must have brought with it a terrible moment of crisis for Sonic Team. Oh shit, someone put out a half decent Sonic game, cried a member of Sonic Team, urgently withdrawing their finger from their nose with a wet plop. We've been trying to slowly and painfully euthanize this franchise for years, and this might turn things around at a stroke. What if another generation of creepy shut Turn into Sonic fans, flooding deviant out with poorly drawn pictures of their original characters and molesting the family pets. Worse yet, what if people start holding Sonic games to actual standards again and we have to put some bloody work in? It won't come to that, cries another Sonic team member, dynamically standing to reveal their fully laden nappy. I'll tell you what we're gonna do, we're gonna pull out all the stops for Sonic Forces, we're gonna make a terrible 3D Sonic game to beat all terrible 3D Sonic games, we're gonna showcase everything we've learned over the last two decades of terrible 3D Sonic games, which is to say absolutely bugger all. No one's gonna be able to so much as think about molesting family pets because they'll be too busy thinking about how bad Sonic Forces is, and whatever Sonic game comes after it will be lauded with praise if it so much as manages to shit on the kitchen floor instead of the carpet. The world is grateful for your sacrifice, Sonic Team. Sonic Forces gargles so much spunk that every parasitic microbe that dwells in its rotten teeth has gotten pregnant with a little turd baby. No really, it's like a fucking compilation clip show of terrible decisions that bad Sonic games have made. It introduces a new generic broody villain who's all powerful and invincible until they aren't. Most of the levels are railroaded super fast sequences that kill you if you press any buttons, and occasionally kill you even if you don't. All of Sonic pals from all previous games show up to collectively waste enough space to rehome all the Syrian refugees. Even that grey dude from Sonic 2006 and Charmy the fucking bee is like holding a symposium for all your favourite rapists. And of course no one can keep their fucking mouth shut for five seconds. You're not funny, Sonic the Hedgehog. You talk like a dorky high school kid who read a book of Yo Mama jokes and then marched confidently into his school cafeteria somehow convinced he wasn't going to walk out of there with an entire lunch tray shoved up his ass. And you know, on paper it seemed like such a promising idea. A Sonic game where the main character wasn't Sonic but a player designed silent protagonist a la the South Park games fighting back against the 
the robotic regime after Sonic is indisposed. Tons of potential there. An unproven character having to earn their way to the level of power and acclaim Sonic already has. So Dr. Robotnik, yes I know we've officially switched to Eggman now, but the bloke who invented the GIF format still pronounces it GIF and he's still fucking wrong, actually could be a credible threat for once. Plus, creating your own protagonist is exactly the sort of thing those creepy shut-ins with their original character fixations need to keep them distracted from bumming the dog. For a moment it seemed like Sonic Team were onto something, but I should have realised that the only thing Sonic Team is on is a big pile of their own shit and piss. Firstly, Robotnik having conquered the world is established solely in a text screen, and otherwise everything seems the same as always. I see no evidence for any other ruling authority in this world, and Robotnik is still 100% focused on battling Sonic and his mates when you'd think he'd have other things to worry about now, like working out his tax plan and getting his enslaved hot squirrel girls to nosh his wrinkly balls. And as for Sonic being indisposed, this lasts for all of one mission before he's suddenly disposed again. They talk a big game about him being imprisoned and tortured, but when we do bust him out he's just sort of standing around, none the worse for wear. In fact I don't think the door was even locked. Incidentally, this section includes my favourite line of dialogue in the game, to wit, the prisoners are being held in some kind of internment facility. So a prison then. Nice to see that sterling resistance intelligence network in action. After this we have to play as Sonic for about half the game. Um, wasn't this supposed to be about our custom protagonist developing into a hero? No, more Sonic! Don't you understand? Sonic is the coolest. You'll play him for half the game and for half the remaining levels you will have to be holding hands with Sonic the whole time. And then at the very end, if you're very lucky, Sonic will fist bump your custom protagonist and tell them they are a cool dude. You will then be provided with tissues to mop up your gushing orgasm. So all in all there's like one scene where our protagonist is scared and helpless against the main villain and then they're equally as powerful as Sonic basically because they decide to be. And that's about it for character development, unless you count the six million cosmetic items that unlock after every stage. Each with its own unlock animation we have to sit through and which collectively make the stage clear screen last about twice as fucking long as the stage itself. Oh yes, and the retro Sonic from Sonic Generations also turns up for reasons that go largely unexplored, probably because the only reason is that Sonic Generations went down alright and Sonic Team officially don't have a fucking clue what you people want anymore. Still it is kinda nice to have a retro Sonic level now and then to break up the god awful modern 3D Sonic levels, gives a nice nostalgic twinge to see enemies being an actual threat again, rather than standing standing gormously in your path in a group arranged not coincidentally like the pins at a bowling alley. These things conquered the world, I'll remind you we are expected to believe. From what? Supermarket trolley attendance? Sonic Forces is a culmination of all Sonic Team's bugaboos, the biggest and hairiest of them being their indecisiveness. Unable to have faith in any of their new ideas, they crowd them out of sight with old ones because they're afraid of disappointing established fans, which is like not using caniston cream because you're afraid of disappointing your vaginal bacteria. The fan base is the key to all of Sonic Team's issues, even Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast is close to 20 fucking years old, and anyone who was into that is now pushing 30 and demanding that their beloved Sonic games have a mature tone so that they can play them and not feel like paedophiles for doing so. And while there's a lot of overlap between stuff for kids and stuff for adults these days, come the fuck on. Fuzzy animals fighting a mad scientist with the power of friendship. It's not Harry Potter, get your fucking dicks out of it. And just because you fucked up Sonic Boom doesn't mean you had to go, whoops, guess rebooting things didn't help, time to put our dicks back in it. But you know what, I have found it gratifying to piss all over a game that's shit for nice straightforward reasons, like the developers being completely fucking inept. Not because it got ass cancer from all the corporations raping it. I can at least suggest ways to fix Sonic. Shift priorities, cut the useless chaff, withdraw dicks. I don't know where you'd begin fixing something like EA. At this point it would be like taking a giant rampaging hippo who has been engineered from birth to feed on money and trying to wean it onto hobnobs. Remember back in the arcade heyday when video games were nice innocent things that just wanted to ruthlessly drain the pocket money from children with no more reward promised than the chance to put a three letter swear word on the high score table? How things have changed! Star Wars Battlefront 2 took one too many trips to the cookie jar and now they've spoiled it for all the other kids. EA, if you were hurting for money that bad there were less obvious more dignified ways you could have gotten it, such as for example going into a Disney board meeting wearing a Chewbacca mask and eagerly sucking them all off while their friends throw bloodstained money. But believe Believe it or not I don't want to dwell on the prevailing loot box controversy because it's been covered to death elsewhere and I'm not a multiplayer guy. I was more pissed off about EA selling Battlefront 1 at full price with no single player campaign and then sticking one in a second equally full price game and expecting forgiveness. But then this is an increasingly popular strategy isn't it? If you've done something shitty, follow it up with an even shittier thing and the first shitty thing will be swiftly forgotten and normalised. Take EA's advice, if you get caught cheating with your wife's sister double down and fuck her guinea pig as well. I want to focus entirely on the story campaign because I figure there's got to be at least one or two creatives buried somewhere in the boil ridden flab folds of EA and Disney's rival under bellies who try to take at least some pride in their work and are now seeing how the controversy has overshadowed everything else and weighing up the pros and cons of castrating themselves with the company lightsaber. There is precedent for EA Games with Battle in the title having a single player largely unrelated to and unrepresentative of the multiplayer, thinking of you Battlefield Hardline for the first time in years. So let's look at the campaign mode in a vacuum, which should be appropriate for a space game. We kick off playing as Iden Versio, a commando and true believer for the evil empire with a name that sounds like a low market electronics company from Eastern Europe. She flies around the galaxy doing commando shit with her two squad members, Del Miko, a slightly nerdy 
bloke with the word meek in his name, and Hask, a sneering imperial blue-eyed boy with the word ass in his name. So here are the things we immediately know for absolute certainty will happen. The Empire's gonna get its ship pushed in, Mercio's going to switch sides, kill Hask in a boss fight at some point, and some ghoulish recreation of Carrie Fisher's corpse will probably call her a cool dude and give her a fist bump. Although the change of heart took a bit longer than I expected, first there's a mission in the forests of Endor, while the Death Star's getting a good hard fisting up the reactor port towards the end of Return of the Jedi, here the game presents the purest definition of a missed opportunity, fighting as a stormtrooper on Endor and not getting a chance to shoot any fucking Ewoks. Versio only conveniently realises the Empire is bad a mission or two later when they decide to shit all over her home planet for basically no reason except that it's the evil space Empire equivalent of coming home drunk and punching your spouse because the boss laid you off and blew up your reactor port. Versio then defects to the Rebels, and after having been smirking with open contempt not ten minutes ago at these nonsensical rebellion values like hope and puppies and not carving up your own civilians like rotisserie chicken, suddenly her personality swivels on a dime and she's ready to wave pom-poms for the puppy brigade without a moment's introspection. It's her sidekick Del who has the believable character arc, cause he's very obviously hiding of a few puppy pictures in his stormtrooper helmet, has a chance meeting with Luke Skywalker early on and spends the rest of the game quoting him like a fanboy emo kid who just bought his first Robert Smith album. You see, in the chapters where you aren't playing Versio you get to play as classic Star Wars characters, presumably to whet your appetite for using heroes in the multiplayer. But if it works then the joke's on you, because after you're done jumping about as Luke Skywalker trying out his new Jesus sandals, that's the last you'll fucking see of him until you've expended enough energy in the little hamster wheel of multiplayer to power the eastern seaboard. Oh, but I wasn't going to talk about that. Most of the classic characters are voiced by impersonators, with the rather glaring exception of Lando Calrissian, you can tell they got the original actor in for him because he sounds about a thousand years old, and delivers lines like he's turning a meat grinder full of staples. As for the gameplay, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Point the pew-pews at the nasty men and one way or the other the nasty men will get out of the way. Although, and the sentence I'm about to say is presently scrabbling at the inside of my lungs like a rat in a cooking pot, maybe we could have done with some kind of cover mechanics. The enemy will take cover like it's going out of style, and all I can do is shuffle behind a fence squinting down my iron sights and cause serious damage to the edge of the box I thought I'd be able to shoot over. Again, this is probably preparation for the multiplayer, where everyone will be charging around in the open like suburban parents on Black Friday and with roughly the same fatality rate, but the multiplayer presumably doesn't have bog-standard stealth mechanics and they stuck those in the single-player boulders brass, virtually useless as they are, when the enemies all get alerted pretty quickly after you kill the first one or two, and Versio's interpretation of crouching is closer to what you do to pass through a doorway on a battleship. Gameplay is, in short, an unexciting grab bag of standard elements, broken up by the odd vehicle section, which is the opportunity to add some of that authentic Star Wars flavour, so of course you pilot X-Wings and Y-Wings, and possibly some other wings that aren't named after chromosomes in frankly insultingly easy flight combat missions, and then there's ground vehicles, but I wonder if the need for authenticity could take a backseat to gameplay once in a while, because I really don't see how anyone could look at an AT-AT walker lumbering along like a rhino in high heels, shooting once per half hour, getting dunked on by whippy little rebel ships that can actually turn around inside a week, and think, wow, piloting one of those must be fun, could probably get my novel finished at last. But fuck all this, we're talking about a story campaign here, and the essence of a story is its ending. I'd love to comment on Battlefront 2's ending, but it doesn't seem to have one. You think it's gonna have one, and then it just doesn't. But don't worry, a text caption assures us that the story continues in multiplayer. Well, fuck me for trying. There I was, giving the benefit of the doubt, only for the doubt to be farted on and thrown back in my face. I felt sorry for you, story campaign. I thought it was a shame you were forced to hang out with your ugly roommate who charges micropayments before they'll do the washing up. I thought I could take you out by yourself and maybe we could all have a little fun and take our minds off your ugly roommate. Little did I realise you were setting up a fucking threesome. Seriously, fucky, eh? Way ahead of your yards, well fuck them a notch less sensitively then. 2017 will be remembered by gaming historians as the year of the premature ejaculation. We had some lovely tumbles in the first two quarters, but then we waited all summer for AAA to warm up for a second round, and all we got was three semi-energetic thrusts on one day in October, and then they came in our eye socket, rolled over and fucking went to sleep. So now we're just killing time with acrimonious arguments over who's sleeping on the wet patch and paying for the Uber in the morning, and there's nothing else coming out this year but ports and remakes. You haven't reviewed COD World War 2 yet, Yards? Oh, but I have, viewer. I've reviewed COD World War 2 more times than I can count. Sometimes it's called Call of Duty, sometimes it's called Battlefield, sometimes it's called Medal of Honor, but it is always nonetheless the same. A lot of Nazis will die, and we'll all learn important lessons about duty and brotherhood before we join the multiplayer and listen to a bunch of grown men calling each other faggots for stealing their kills, while the publisher tries to tacitly convince us to blow our life savings on premium VD medicine. Besides, going back to World War II is a shamelessly retrograde move that I don't want to encourage because next platform shoes might come back. AAA these days is only AAA in the sense that the word aggravating also has three A's in it. I think we should attempt trial separation from AAA until at least the new year. So let's play some goddamn indies. Hand of Fate 2 is an action-packed high fantasy game consisting entirely of one incredibly long and boring coach ride during which we're stuck sitting opposite a really ugly nun who is going to insist on teaching you her favourite card game no matter how many times you suggest switching to the travel scrabble. So what we have here is a hybrid of deck building game and a D&D session being run by someone who's just a little bit too into it. The premise being that we're using the game to go over the events of our adventuring life thus far that led us to only being able to afford a seat in economy class. This being the case, my adventurous life seems to have consisted of an awful lot of repeating the same adventure multiple times 
and swearing at dice. The actual gameplay of each campaign consists of moving from encounter to encounter, except beforehand you get to pick what random encounters are included in the deck alongside the ones required by the story. Mostly the challenge is centred around juggling probability and resource management, until the need for combat suddenly arises, at which point the game chucks all that numbers bullshit in the bin and puts you out with some monsters for a few minutes so you can twat each other with sticks. Kind of like live action role playing, I suppose, except that you can die of something other than embarrassment. Can't help noticing that great big two hanging off the title like a big coiled turd that won't break off, Yards. Do I need to have played Hand of Fate 1? Not really, imaginary questioner. I'd put Hand of Fate 2 alongside Left 4 Dead 2 in the category of sequels that kind of make the original obsolete, because it's basically the same game but fleshed out and with more bells and whistles. Some of which did feel like gilding the lily a tad, like character customization options, whatever helps you get immersed, sure, but in a game where most of your actions are being merely described in text, doesn't feel like our appearance matters much unless the text contrives for the action to frequently take place in a hairdresser's. Also, as well as deciding random outcomes with the success failure three card Monte, we've now got dice rolls and a weird stop the pendulum game. I guess the pendulum is theoretically more skill based than random, but in practice it can get fucked. The thing you're trying to point at is commonly about the size of a bush baby's bollocks, and I swear there's a very slight controller delay so trying to skillfully hit the target has roughly the same success rate as putting the controller in a bag of marbles and kicking it across the room. On the whole though this shit is quite my jam. Disclaimer, do not use shit as jam, it will make for a poor morning's breakfast. But I've got a fondness for this sort of FTL style procedural storytelling and by strange coincidence I also enjoy the countercentric Batman Arkham style combat. If you only like one of those things you might not enjoy the way the other keeps interrupting it but for me, having a special button that lets me take a break from all this fiddling about with cards and numbers so I can beat the snot out of the characters for two minutes is a feature I could do with in virtually any game. It'd certainly liven up Animal Crossing. It might not be the most elegantly designed combat in the world, I feel like it uses too many buttons. One for attack, one for other attack, one for special attack, one for finisher attack, one for block, one for evade, one for the little boy who lives down the lane, and more often than not the enemies clump together and the action becomes a big confusing rugby scrum where the counter prompts are pretty much all you have to go on. But no deals have been broken thus far. What can be a bit galling is when you've carefully optimised your deck and spent an hour getting lucky rolls and calculating yourself into the perfect position, only to lose it all on the final boss fight because you failed to dodge his dick slap finisher, or the other way around, maybe you're down to 5 health but masterfully fought off 16 guys without taking a single hit, only for the next random card to take 15 health off you because you tried to pick up a coin and accidentally punched yourself in the balls. See, it's where the game switches between its two distinct gameplay cores that there's the occasional grinding of gears. Personally I'm not that interested in the whole deck building concept, it's the sort of thing I've come to associate with odd smelling rooms above comic book shops, into which large numbers of Cheetos unwittingly wander and are never seen again. The whole process of building my encounter deck before every campaign was a bit of a chore. Yes, there's a button to automatically fill out the deck, but I swiftly found I couldn't trust it. It was always leaving out interesting new cards and leaving in that fucking overpriced pie shop, and that one ring that reduces fire damage when the main enemy that uses fire is about as hard to dodge as a Republican tax code. I think the major issue I have with this otherwise unique and absorbing game is one of momentum. Some of the campaigns can go on for very long, and when I fail them right at the last hurdle I feel quite disheartened and unsure if I could stand to start all over again. What might help is, say, a quick restart button I could press at this point to just shuffle the decks and start again, bish bash bosh and no bother. What most certainly does not help is to dangle the victory token in front of me for a minute, going ooh look at this lovely shiny thing you're not going to have now, better flamboyantly put it back in my pile of things that aren't for losers, before I make all the cards fly around the room for five minutes and kick you back to the deck building screen so you can try to figure out where you fucked this up. A slave to the swishy wishy effects this game, nothing moves unless it can fly around a bit first. Yes, I understand some of this is probably covering loading times, which is presumably why we have to stare at a Winamp visualisation from the early 2000s for a minute before every combat, but it's a bit of a pace killer. So that's Hand of Fate, it's like finding your mum's vibrator as a kid. It's intriguing and you can have fun with it, but it's occasionally sticky in ways that probably aren't worth thinking about. So another year is lolloping to a close like a walrus rolling inexorably down a hill towards a threshing machine and there's only one week left for catch-ups before the end of year festivities. But what, of all the games I never got around to in 2017, most deserves a last minute second look? Some indie darling, something that proved influential in retrospect like Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, or perhaps a game where one of the goals is to find all of the toilets and deposit in each one a big smelly farty poo. I think we all know the answer to that one, so yeah, South Park the Fractured But Whole. There's actually a clever joke in that subtitle, did you spot it? Fractured But Whole? That's right, you can't have something fractured and whole at the same time! Oh, the mind-bending feats of wordplay of those clever young whippersnappers who make South Park. Clever middle-aged whippersnappers, rather. Middle-aged whippersnappers still making a living out of poo jokes. My goodness, my glass house is sparkling delightfully in the morning sun. What a nice day to indulge in my favourite hobby of projectile mineralogy. So why didn't I review South Park the traumatised anus when it came out? I did play it, but I just kind of stopped midway through. Partly because I was having trouble thinking of things to say that I hadn't already said about the last game, Stick of Truth. It's the same town, you walk around it or rather hop around it because the animation's so crude it's recovered from subterranean hydrocarbons. The plot concerns all the kids playing a big make-believe roleplay together that eventually starts blurring with the real world, and a lot of toilets get pooed in. But I came back to the game last week and finished it because in the intervening time I took it upon myself to watch all the episodes of South Park I hadn't seen. After all, I have to justify my Hulu subscription somehow. And having caught up, you know what, the show's still pretty good. Yeah, obviously it's not as good as it was, that's the nature of the beast. It's fun to swing a dead polecat around your head, but it's not going to be the same after you've had to stitch the dead polecat back together ten or eleven times. But it's holding together as well as can be expected for an adult cartoon with twenty plus seasons. Certainly
certainly a fuckload better than The Simpsons, which is currently best equivalent to a man being dragged behind a car as it does donuts in Times Square, losing more and more bits of skin and flesh with every spin while he screams and screams and upsets the children but just won't fucking die. But yes, having caught up, I could understand all the new characters and changes in South Park, like how those two lads have gone gay all of a sudden, but that's sort of the first problem with fractured bum tits poo poos, that it feels a lot more reliant on the player's foreknowledge of the show than Stick of Truth was. Stick of Truth's plot was self-contained enough that I could get into it despite not having watched South Park since my last circumcision, but Damage Sphincter is literally a direct continuation of a couple of episodes of the show where the kids play as superheroes. Seems a bit optimistic to expect us to have seen the whole show in this age of endless competition for our eyeballs between YouTube, Netflix, video game, social media going outside Mrs. Braithwaite's bathroom window, as much as the fact that my first attempt to play Broken Body led to me seeking out the series again kind of proves that cross-promotion works. Not everyone has as much free time as me because they have real jobs and probably haven't murdered all their friends. But let's get back to the game. Having been made King of Fantasyland after the events of Stick of Truth, our custom protagonist suddenly finds his, her or its world shattered when his, her or its friends tragically decide to play something else and we must reinvent ourselves from the ground up as a superhero, superheroine or super thing. You embark on a quest to find a lost cat, uncover a hidden conspiracy of people sticking their faces in cats' asses, which is another thing that's going to fly completely over your head like a severely weathered dead polecat if you haven't watched the relevant episode, and there's a prolonged running gag about my goodness aren't there a lot of superhero franchises in popular culture these days. But don't be turned off if you think it's going to be nothing but that kind of biting lofty minded satire because the protagonist's superpower is the ability to fart so hard that they warp reality. Thus is the tone set and the tone sounds like this. <laughs> Gameplay-wise, it's like they took the Stick of Truth gameplay and streamlined it in a tree shredder. The main thing you do on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is loot every container in the room with a yellow highlight. It's like a year in fetishist's Christmas morning. But where in Stick of Truth you'd have to look at the list of stuff in each piss box and select Take All, now everything gets automatically hoovered into your pocket as soon as you open it, which effectively cuts your workload in half at a stroke. But that's not all, there's quite a sumptuous bounty of features that Fractured But Whole doesn't have anymore. Equipment, equipment upgrades, perks, all coming soon to a landfill near you. What you get is, you pick a character class, your class gets three attacks and a super attack and that's your lot. How your character improves proves is that every few levels you unlock a new slot into which special patches can be placed, which is a surprisingly deep system and requires quite a bit of thought, but here's a brief beginner's tutorial. If you see a patch with a number on it that's higher than the patch you've currently got, equip that patch instead. Now for the advanced lesson, once you've unlocked two patch slots, equip the patch with the second highest number on it. If you're having trouble figuring out how numbers work, try punching yourself in the balls the same number of times as each patch and then equip the patch that made your balls hurt the most. Close sarcasm quotes. I'd say the only place the gameplay of the mutilated sphincter has evolved any is in the combat, which has gone from the simplistic row-based system to a flashy chest board affair where we take turns to move our guys into optimal positions to use different attacks that all affect unique patterns of squares. But don't be too intimidated by the need for grand strategy because you can also do a big stinky fart in the enemy's face that means he misses a turn and you can freely punch them in the face a few times. Which I found personally gratifying because whenever I played chess with my brother when we were kids he always accused me of making that rule up. Frankly though the combat often felt like a chore and it's not the mechanics fault it was that the lack of equipment or perks or much else the game had to reward me with made me getting into random battles feel like I wasn't doing much more than wasting two minutes of my life. In the end the big picture is this. I can think of several standout memories moments from Stick of Truth, the alien abduction, the retro RPG section in Canada, that bit where you get shrunk down and have to avoid being squashed by your parents fucking. But very little stands out in my memory of the injured rectum. I remember it as a prolonged sequence of going to places and fighting some dudes. And I remember that the game's final boss fight took place about half an hour too early, then events just trundle along for a bit before the story just sort of peters out and abruptly ends, leaving me feeling like the gerbil in my asshole had suffocated to death before I'd even brought myself off. So that's Fractured But Whole, it's Stick of Truth but not so much. Bit of a dowdy note to end the year on really, so here are some pictures of ladies' bottoms.